All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is November 1st, 2023. And today we are going to follow up with what I was sharing in this last video, not directly related. So in this video, we called it the mystery of Luke knowing all things in order. Man, if you've been following this ministry for a little bit and you really want to understand these mysteries, oh my goodness, this this one is awesome. It's truly awesome. But unless you're looking through end time eyes and understand the revelation of the end of days, there's no way you're going to get what's what's being laid out. And it, it's all about the understanding that comes from uh, Ecclesiastes 1.9. What was shall be, what is shall be. Meaning from creation to Christ, Old Testament was, shall be, and the is to come. The, the is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib is the is which will reflect the is to come. These, this means that within the Old Testament and the New Testament are mysteries, prophetic insights, way deeper than we've ever understood before, that we've been revealing here for six years, that give us understanding, greater understanding than has ever been revealed before in relation to the end of days. And this is one that you're going to see, incredible revelation. And today, what I'm sharing and why I'm saying it relates to the last one is because in the last video, I spoke about um, uh, the different the, these different periods of time and that there's worker groups within them. And we can clearly see one that's connected to the beginning Luke group, the, this pre-trib group. But there's this mid-trib group, which is the 144,000. And that often gets a lot of people twisted up. Because the majority of people believe it's the 144,000 first and, and the great multitude rapture is everybody. And, and it's just confusion because everybody has missed that there's actually 14 years, two sets of seven. The first one is the final charge for the remaining Gentiles, world, house of Israel that are left. And then it will be the seven years for the Jews. And a lot of people confuse that. They, they confuse that Antichrist is Satan and Satan is Antichrist. Nope. Antichrist is during seals, during trumpets, it's Satan, but then Antichrist returns. I mean, it's an incredible story when you see it revealed before your eyes in the scriptures. It's so awesome. And in this one, I'm going to break down a little bit more because there, there's been a, a lot of back and forth, not only with this ministry, and it's always great to have the back and forth and, and get the conversations going. Unfortunately, we're not always able to get to every conversation some conversations, man, they go so deep and they're so heavy. It just takes a lot of time. And when we're working on a bunch of different things at once, sometimes we miss some of them. So and, and one of the reasons I say that is because anybody that wants to join us, you can come to this right here, ministryrevealed.com. And when you click on there, you'll come to the website. This is the landing page of the website, ministryrevealed.com. We wrote a book. You don't have to buy it on Amazon if you don't want to. We've got it in five languages for free on PDF on the website on the book page. You can also read the book from the website, really like literally the whole book's there on the website for you to read. Um, or you can listen to it right here in audio and English. But if you're new, the very first place I recommend everybody to come is this word intro. In this intro, there's, uh, there's a number of videos, but this first four videos, 22 minutes, that will introduce the next three videos to give you a little taste of what's about to be revealed. Then a 30-minute Bible study revealing the first mystery that happened in this ministry, which is the differences of who the Gospels are speaking to. These differences within the Gospels are prophetic. You know, it, it had never been understood. People always said, oh, it was just perspective we've been taught. It's not. There was prophecy. Was there perspective when you're looking through the lens of the is that we're still living in? Yes. But it doesn't answer all of the discrepancies within the, the synoptic Gospels, especially the discrepancies of the events that happened when the same event is spoken of, not just differently, but different time frames, different people there. I mean, it's very fascinating. What you're going to begin to realize in this 30-minute Bible study is that the differences in the Gospels is because they're speaking to different groups. You'll understand this in the prophetic, too, because once you get more understanding, you'll realize that this difference is why the, synopt uh, why the discourses are so different. Mark and Matthew may seem similar, but there's a ton of differences because everybody stops in Matthew 24. 
But the rest of Matthew's discourse goes all the way into 25. Luke's doesn't. So there's a reason for these differences, and the understanding will begin in this 30-minute video. Once you begin to understand that, you will now understand the revelation of the end of days being 14 years. This is where you will begin to understand it. It's called 14 years and a little bit above. The above is called 50 days. We've revealed that here in this ministry for a number of years. You're, when, when you see it, by first understanding these differences in the Gospels, uh, it, everything will start to open to you. You will have questions answered that you maybe scratched your head over for decades. That You've maybe gone to pastors and Bible studies and nobody really ever gave you a clear answer. You'll begin to get them here. Then prophetically, when you're looking in the end of days, because this is a prophetic ministry, an end of days ministry, you'll realize that the end of days is 14 years, seven of seals and seven of trumpets. And just like Jews weren't ready when Christ came the first time, the church won't be ready when he comes this time. That's why the pre-trib group is a portion, is a 10% of the church who is the ready watching bride, Gentile bride of Christ. And then it'll be seven years for the remaining of the world for the church to come in. They will be part of the great multitude rapture. And then when the seven years of trumpets are over, the 14 years are over, and the Lord has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives at that 14th year, the Jews will be there. It'll all be over pre, mid, and post were all true. That's why you could see those differences in the Gospels. And this one is uh, a 30-minute intro to it as well. And then this fourth video, it's all because of Matthew, will help you to understand. It, it will literally reveal to you how it was all missed. And it's incredible. And the simple answer is it's all because of Matthew. Because we've all been taught from pastors, teachers, everybody has learned their prophecy from the foundation of the Gospel of Matthew, which is a seven-year perspective to the Jews, not realizing who Mark was speaking to and who Luke was speaking to. It's so important. And when you do, I promise you, it'll all open up. This one's a big study. It's two hours and 45 minutes long. After you've watched those and you've, you've, you've prayed over it, you've, you've gone to see the studies for yourself, then you can start going a little bit deeper and uh, go into, I mean, this is a three-hour video just unlocking more of those revelations in the Gospels. You'll see that pre, mid, and post are all true. Incredible, incredible stuff in there. All right? So that's what you're going to find. Um, and then for today, um, as I was saying, you know, oh, I guess I should have said, <laughs> when I went to ministryrevealed.com, in that menu box, there's a drop down there called the forum or forum. And you can just go register in there. It takes a few seconds and you can join for free. There's almost 1,200 people worldwide and people are just sharing and prayers and news and Bible studies and questions and all sorts of things going on in there. Uh, Like-minded brothers and sisters all over the world. So you can come and join us there as well. And so today what we're going to focus on is some of this right here. The 144,000. Because... Now, now, when I say focus, I don't mean it's just going to be our focus. I mean, I want to be able to show these differences and show where these things match up and where I don't believe they match up. Because a number of people over the years in the forum, in our ministry, as well as others that have questions and send me questions, believe that as they've started to study these things more, that it's possible that the first group of workers that remain behind from the bride of Christ will be 144,000 workers, and that it's possible that then there are another 144,000 workers for the time of trumpets. And so this is what I want to clarify tonight. This is what we're going to spend some time in. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I always like using this. This program is called eSort, as you can see up here. It's free or a few dollars uh, a year, not very much. And uh, depending on what you use for your for your device. And uh, you see, you can get KJV. You can get all sorts of different Bible translations. And with the plus, you have the Strong's numbers behind every word. And you can dig deeper into all these revelations and their understandings. So I recommend it for everybody. It, it's my favorite one. I've used other ones, but this one's my favorite. And no, it's not a sponsorship. I don't get paid by them. I don't get paid by any sponsors purposely. No commercials either. So if you see ads on my videos, that's just YouTube putting them on because I've said no to ads. So 
one of the things that people um, ask, is in particular in the ministry as well, is this possibility because we see 144,000 here in chapter 7. And then when you go to chapter 14, we see the 144,000 again. So some people believe that maybe it's a possibility that there's 144,000 in the first worker group, and then there's another 144,000 later. And I've explained this in the past, that what we're seeing in Revelation 7 is simply when they're, when they're, they're getting uh, sealed. And here, they already have, you see, his father's name written in their foreheads. So here, what you're seeing is just later on. Their father's name, the father's name is already written in their foreheads at this point. OK, and you're going to see some very uh, telling pieces within this as well. Like it says, these are they which follow the lamb wheresoever he goeth. Well, we know things about the lamb. We know this wording connected to wheresoever he goes. So if here is when they have their father's names written in their foreheads. It's not that this group is a different group because this is when they're coming to seal. Right. This is when they're coming to seal. You see, hurt not the earth till we have sealed. OK, so this is what we're seeing. This is the group being sealed at the later right near the end of seals at about sometime at the end of the six seal uh, end of six years and at the start of the seventh year of tribulation or at the start of the seventh year of seals. This is the one hundred forty four thousand being sealed. And in Revelation 14, what we're seeing is is now them being readied to go out. Okay, now they're getting ready. Now they're going to be sent out. And where do we see the lamb standing? A lamb stood on the Mount Zion. So what's he doing on Mount Zion? A lot of people, this is something that has confused many, many people over the years in, in prophecy. And a lot of people will just skip through it because they don't understand it. And so there's no need to, to bring it up to others. Because when the Lord returns, as everybody believes, and he will, when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, he's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. He's not coming on Mount Zion. Okay? We know what this means in this ministry. We're going to touch on this more in a little bit as well, showing how the end of the, the sixth year of seals and the start of the seventh, which is Revelation 7, is, is clearly the same point as this, after they've been sealed, and now they're, they're going to be sent out. And... One of the, the other pieces within this is the understanding that I always talk about, which is in the 144,000, it names out the, the different tribes. But within the differences, oops, in Revelation 7, but within the differences of these tribes, I just went to John because I switched, Revelation 7. Within these tribes, we see that Levi and Joseph are there. We know that Dan is missing. Okay, so you had Manasseh and Joseph. Joseph fill, fills in for Ephraim, and Levi is filling in for Dan, right? Levi didn't have its own portion. Levi was just that, that priestly line. So something else is going on with Dan and Ephraim. And I believe we've been able to show this over the years as being this representation of the first workers during the time of seals we've covered it many times you know if you go to if somebody's new you go to luke chapter 12 and we know that there are three specific worker groups there there's actually four but there's three that we know of clearly mentioned in luke chapter 12 when he's talking to them and we know that this first group in 1235 when he says, let your lights be burning and you yourselves uh, like men that wait for the Lord when he returns from the wedding. So he's talking about returning from the Gentile wedding. The pre-trib bride escapes at the beginning of the 50 days. There's the wedding in heaven for seven physical days on the earth. And when the Lord will return from this wedding, he's not coming on Mount Zion. He's not coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. We've been able to show prophetically through scripture in the differences in the Gospels, why in Luke 11, Jesus says he would be as Jonah was. Those were prophecies. They haven't been fulfilled yet. A lot of people will tell you that those are the 40 days after his resurrection. Well, they weren't because he didn't go around warning them that 
when they're compassed about and they need to flee and when these devastations are coming upon them. He hasn't done that yet. He was speaking prophetically to an understanding of the final generation. That's why there's such differences between the story of Jonah within Luke, Mark, and Matthew. They were all prophetic. They haven't been fulfilled yet. And so when we're seeing this, we know that this is a specific group of worker when he returns from the wedding on the eighth day, when he's coming as Jonah was, when he's coming as a, uh, um, as a prophet. So the son of man is coming as the white horse rider, as a prophet, and he's going to be warning Jerusalem, warning the Jewish people that when they see themselves compassed, is he going to be doing more? Most likely. I don't know if he's traveling the world. I don't know what he's doing, how he's doing it. But we know that he's doing this specific portion in Jerusalem, and he's going to come as a prophet, as Jonah was, and he's not going to be running around claiming, I am the Christ. People will know who he is, like these guys here. This group right here, that he comes and serves when he returns, is this first watch group. And then you know this because when you get to uh, ver uh, tw chapter 12, verse 38 and 39, or even in 38, it says, and if he will come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. So what three watches is he talking about? He's talking about a group prophetically built into the gospels revelations in the synoptic gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And they're most clearly revealed to us, <clears throat> excuse me, in the last chapter of each gospel. However, there is another worker group. I don't know if they're called uh, watchmen, like people that would watch, like in these three watch groups, or if they're just, they've got a, a different title because we know that they're going to be the modern day apostles. So why aren't they mentioned here? Well, because he's telling these guys to be ready when he returns from the wedding. The apostle group, he already anointed with the Holy Ghost at the beginning of the 50 days. So the escape of the bride of Christ happens. He returns after the escape on the same day. I'm going to show it to you. Returns on the same day, then anoints the apostles. Then he returns and goes to the wedding. It's incredible the amount of details we can get. So we see that this modern day apostles that will be upon the earth, they were already given their authority and instructions before he leaves for the wedding okay now was this group is this first watch worker group being informed as well yes they're also being informed but it's not the same type of thing he's doing with the apostles and you'll see this this is something we've broken down in uh in many ways throughout the ministry and many teachings but let me show you now the order so you can see these three watch groups and they relate to a group of people being revealed to us at the end of Luke, the end of Mark, and the end of Matthew. Now, when this all starts, you're going to see that John's gospel has this dual play in it, if you will. There are two things going on within the gospel of John. Because in the resurrection story, what, we, what we're able to show is the, is the coming of the 40 days of the Son of Man. His return as the lamb uh, at the end of the sixth seal and the return when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of trumpets. It's all revealed in the last chapter of each book. Those are the three workers uh, watch groups that Luke chapter 12 is talking about. But when it comes to the gospel of John, John is not called a synoptic gospel. His book stands on his own. And we have revealed what it means within what we call chapters to years. And within Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's the last chapter of each gospel that has the resurrection story of Christ. Except in John. When you get to John, who's not one of the synoptics, his resurrection story is in chapter 20. It's not in chapter 21. Which, when you understand this revelation of the end of days, it is absolutely fascinating we were able to show through these revelations that it is unequivocal that it is absolutely 100 true that every word in the scriptures 
including the division of chapters, the division of verses, the way they're laid out, were also prophetically laid out by the Spirit working through all of them, not simply the writers. That is something we've been able to prove out in this ministry so incredibly. And this is one of them. Because John's gospel with 21 chapters, to anybody that's new, the way it plays out is really 21 years. And then the final 22nd is the Jubilee, just like the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters. And the story is like Jacob working for his father-in-law. It's the same prophetic story. And what does it have to do with the very first seven years? Jacob works expecting Rachel, but ends up getting Leah. And he worked for seven years, but he said they flew by like days because he was so in love with her. So the last seven years, which we're in the seventh right now, these final 50 are the end of the seventh. Okay. We're not in them yet, but we are in the 70th from Feast of Trumpets 2023 to Feast of Trumpets 2024. We are in, I believe, this final seventh year. And to Jacob, he said they flew by. So like a picture to Christ. He was so excited. They flew by like days because he was so in love, only to find out he gets the one who's called weary, right? He gets Leah. Leah was weary. That's, that's what her name means. And because she wasn't as beautiful, right? It wasn't the one that he wanted. You see, it's like Christ. He didn't come for his Gentile bride. He came, even though he loves his Gentile bride of Christ, he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which is his Rachel. All right. That's the picture that you're seeing here. And so the first seven, which is like John's first seven chapters, and then you've got chapter eight through 14, eight through 14. They're, they're a picture of like the seven years of seals in and around that time frame, the, the son of man's 40 days and everything beginning, all that type of stuff. And then you have the final seven, which is 15 through 21. But as you know, if you've studied the story of Jacob, he worked seven years expecting Rachel, but got Leah. They flew by like days. Then he put in another seven years for a total of 14 years, like the story says in, um, in Genesis 31. He worked seven more years, and then he got Rachel. And then what happened? Well, then he worked six more years. Then he worked six more years. And in total, he says, I have been 20 years, 14 years for your daughters and seven for the cattle. And what happened at the end of those 20 years? He made a covenant with his father-in-law at the end of 20. So at the start of 21. But what is that a picture of? In the end of days, these what we call seven easy years. It doesn't mean everybody's life is easy. It just means compared to tribulation, this is paradise right now. Compared to tribulation. Now, I understand people have a lot of things going on in their lives and there's chaos in the world. I get it. But I'm speaking comparatively to being left behind in tribulation. All right. So when these seven years end, then you have the 14 years left of tribulation. And how many years is it of tribulation? Seven of seals and seven of trumpets. However, it ends after 13 years. Because at the 14th year, you're going to see the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives to fulfill what's called the day of the Lord or the year of his wrath. So what you see at the very end of 13, you could say, is right when the Lord would then be coming down feet down on the Mount of Olives. He'll be seen coming and then the 14th year begins. So what you're seeing here in John chapter 20, just like you would see here. Like in John chapter 8, you see the, the Son of Man is here. The bride is before him. Uh, like a, a, he's on bended knee. You see um, he is now the light of the world. Okay, It's even a picture of in the 14-year portion, but related to that beginning piece of everything after the bride or soon as the bride is taken out. You come to chapter 14, and you, you read about the story that he goes to prepare a place. And when he returns, he's going to gather them to where he is. And so, they'll be always there with him, right? He's gone to prepare a place for them in his father's house that when he returns, he'll receive them unto my, himself. And there they shall be also. 
This is when it's going to happen. At the beginning, or actually in the middle of the seventh year of seals, after the 144 are sealed, the great multitude rapture will happen in the midst of the seventh year of seals, which just like John is showing the 14th chapter, him coming on paradise with paradise or heavenly Mount Zion, where the great multitude rapture group is going to go. But why is the resurrection story in John chapter 20? Why isn't it like the other gospels and in the last chapter? It's the picture of the end of days. This is when the Lord returns. So when he, when you understand more of what will take place that I'm not going to talk about now, and the and and he returns, he's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives right at the very end. It's a picture within the Gospels of this pre-mid post thing going on. And then he fulfills, whoops, and then he fulfills that final year, which is like Zechariah 14. There he is feet down on the Mount of Olives. And now it's the destruction again of all the enemies. Satan is bound. Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown in the pit. But this is right at the very end of it, at the great earthquake, right like at the line dividing, the very end of the of the 13th year to the 14th. Because just like the story of Jacob with his father-in-law that played out over 20 years, we know when it was over, that's the same picture you're getting here, right when it was over. So the, the story in John chapter 20 is like a picture right at the line between 20 and 21 when 21 is just about to start. And you're going to see these connections to it that you're only going to find in Matthew 28. You'll see what I mean when I get there. It's a perfect connection and absolutely prophetic. And so what you're seeing is just like Jacob, he made a covenant with his father-in-law after 20 years. What do you see? Jesus in the picture of his resurrection when he made what? A new covenant, right? When he made a covenant with us. So you're seeing it in chapter 20, for which we know here in this ministry, when the Lord returns feet down for that final year that he's fulfilling, he's going to renew the covenant that he made when he came at the end of, or, or came in the seventh year of seals, at that seventh seal, which is the about the second half of trumpet uh, of the seventh year of seals, he's going to make a covenant. And he's going to make this covenant and then it's going to get broken when Satan is cast down and the pit is open. And then when he returns after being cut off, he's going to return feet down. And just like the story of Jacob, he's going to make a covenant after 21 years or at the start of 21. That's why you see it at the very uh, in John 20, which is a picture of the very end of the 13th year. And there's your 14th year. It's complete. These little differences, these little insights are completely revealing of the holy ghost at work and what you're going to notice is there's two things going on not only does john have what we call chapters to years maybe you guys have heard something similar with the with the psalms but you would have heard it up till about 1999 2000 and then it didn't seem to fit anymore well we've revealed things in psalms as well that within the gospels within the books there's prophetic insight to the events happening in the end of days, chapter after chapter, year by year in the coming events. And what you're going to notice with John is here I am about to start it for you in John. Yet when the story's all over, it ends in John. Pretty interesting, right? So we have the synoptic gospels of Luke, Mark, Matthew. So Matthew's first. Everybody learned from Matthew. Never really understood what Mark and what Luke was for. Yet everybody saw that there were differences in the Gospels, but nobody could understand them. So why the confusion of 7,000 years? Why the confusion of only seven years? Because everybody's been learning from the Gospel of Matthew. So that's their foundation in everything else they look at going forward in prophecy. And that's why it was missed that Mark's years are the seven of seals. Matthew's are the seven of trumpets. This is why they think it's Antichrist who's going to build the temple. It's not the case. The Lord will actually be here on heavenly Mount Zion. <laughs> it's so incredible. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end, the first will be last. The last will be first. So in the end of days, it goes Luke pre, Mark, mid, Matthew, post. John stands on his own. But it's interesting with John because it begins in John in the prophetic as well. 
and then it goes into Luke, and then it goes into Mark, and then it goes into Matthew. And when Matthew 28, and we get to the end with Matthew 28, it brings us all the way back to the picture of John, of Luke, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the picture of Jesus in John chapter 20 and him coming again. So it starts here. And when the 50 days and 14 years or that 13th year comes to an end, right? This is like the 13th, the 20th, or you can say the 13th coming to an end. This is that same picture. So when we were talking a little bit ago, what we see is even in this picture here, it's Mary Magdalene. And we did a study on this as well uh, uh, quite a while back. Mary Magdalene is a picture, is a prophetic typology of the bride of Christ. And he sees Mary Magdalene first. It's Mary Magdalene, and then she's going to tell them. And what does he tell her? We only read this again in John. That touch me not in John chapter 20, verse 17. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Okay. Now what happens? She's going to go tell them. And what happens? Jesus is going to the father. So this is a picture here that of, of the pre-trib bride. The pre-trib is now taken. This, this is Jesus here taking away the bride before he returns. As it says right here in John 20, verse 19, then the same day at evening. So the, then the Lord Jesus returns on the same day at evening. So in this picture of the beginning of the 50 days, when it all starts, we see the prophetic typology of the bride of Christ being taken out. And the Lord saying, hey, tell my people, get them ready, because I'm coming back to what? Well, he meets with the apostles first. This is where he now comes. He comes you know, everybody freaks out a bit. And then what happens in verse 22? Jesus breathes on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retained, they are retained. So here he is on the same day of the pre-trib escape. The escape happens. The Lord has now taken them. They're gone to the third heaven into the lowest room. And they're there. He returns to the earth on the same day in, in the evening. He's going to have his chosen apostles. And when he chooses these apostles, whoever they may be, they're going to receive the full power of the Holy Ghost, if you will. It'll be beyond what they received the first time when this played out in the is. This will be for the modern day, end of days apostles. They are one of the worker groups. And like I said, in Luke chapter 12, they weren't mentioned. It was only the Luke, Mark, and Matthew ones that were mentioned. This is the one, though, that takes place first. And we've shared, and we'll touch on it again, how we can see all the differences in these four worker groups, even in the book of Revelation. So here he is breathing on them. And then what does he do? He leaves. He's now gone to the wedding. So the pre-trib bride has been removed. There's, there's a remnant group of workers who, when he was here, it, it, I wonder even if you could say Mary Magdalene, not only is she a type of the pre-trib bride that's taken, but we know that there is a remnant bride that remains, right? We know that there is a remnant bride that remains to to uh, uh, serve the Lord, who will follow him for 40 days, and then who will work during at least the time of seals. So she may also be a typology of a remnant bride as well. But I don't want to go down that path and get everybody uh, uh, mixed up with it. Because really, she's a, a prophetic picture of the bride. Okay, We talked about this uh, in her name, meaning the tower, and and we went to the Song of Solomon, and and, and the whole meaning of it there. So she is a prophetic picture of the bride of Christ. And the Lord is now ascended. He has taken his bride of Christ. He returns back the same day at evening. And he anoints these guys, these modern day apostles, 
whether it's 12 or more this time, I don't know, but I believe it will be 12, and you'll see why at the end. Because the Holy Ghost, the power is gone, guys. Right? We spoke about this before. Imagine the force of that power when everybody on earth, with the exception of now the apostles and with the exception of the remnant workers that we're going to talk about in Luke and show those the differences between them not being 144,000, we see that they're the only ones left on the earth who are spirit-filled. Because everybody pre pre-trib that left as the Gentile bride of Christ is, are the ones who are in Christ spirit-filled. That's pretty wild. That's crazy wild. So imagine that kind of power leaving the earth. That is the go-ahead. That's the go-ahead that we read about in, in Romans, I think, chapter 8. That's the go-ahead that when all of this power and authority is now gone, the, en the enemy is now just waiting to go. He's waiting for this time. And we see this like in Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature, this is, this is the great multitude rapture. This is the, this is the group during Mark that, that will come in during seals. Waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Hello. You see, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. This creature, we only read this word creature in the New Testament in Mark's gospel. In fact, even in uh, Mark's gospel, because they're going to help bring in the great multitude rapture, the 144 will help in that seventh year to bring them in. You see, they're waiting for what? The manifestation of the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Everybody who is in Christ's spirit filled. What manifestation? They're waiting for them to be disclosed, to be revealed, to be turned to light. They're, they're taken. The pre-trib is taking place. And now what's going to happen? Because all of that spirit power that's been taken out of the world, they're... It, it, it's tribulation time, all right? It's where everything breaks out. So then what happens, like I said, and again, we've covered this before, but I wanted to show you these different worker groups in order so that when I focus on the one, you'll understand the timing if you're newer and, and this group and who they are. So we see that now Jesus has left after breathing on them and he doesn't return. Thomas was upset because he wasn't there. And then the Lord is, returns again after eight days. So now he's returning. He's gone to the wedding for seven full days, and he's returning the eighth day. What's it a picture of? That's the first, the first seven to the eight days from the pre-trib to now when the Lord returns as Jonah, as I told you about earlier. Now he's coming as Jonah, but he's going to meet with the apostles one more time briefly to see what they did during the seven-day wedding when he gave them all of this power and authority because they're now the portion that relates to the beginning of the greatest revival in human history. And we see this when we go to Revelation chapter 2 because that's another thing we've revealed here in this ministry. You can read it in the book. You can watch videos we have in the uh, – it's even in the, uh, uh, um, the intro series about the seven churches. Because Ephesus is a prophetic picture of the beginning of the 50 days. Not a prophetic picture of the bride being taken out, but it's a prophetic picture of the apostles when they were anointed. This is the, the prophetic picture of the church of Ephesus. Ephesus, we, we've got some incredible teachings on, on the seven churches and what happened in Ephesus that, that a meteor had come down and it was Diana that was created from it and and all of these things, that's because Ephesus and the beginning of the 50 days at the moment of the escape, there's also going to be a meteor coming. Whether it splits up and hits other many parts of the earth, is it just big pieces and huge pieces that hits? I don't know, but the world is going to see it coming. And it's directly connected at the beginning of the 50 days. And so when the apostles have this anointing, 
they're going to have it throughout their whole time that they're working but the um the 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 core of Ephesus here in the story of the seven churches is that seven day wedding while the Lord's gone. So he anoints them. He leaves to the wedding. They now have that power and authority. And then he returns to see how they did after that seven day wedding. OK, that's that's the picture of what you're seeing. Now, do these guys remain during seals? Yes, absolutely. They remain during seals. They're the ones we know at the end were responsible for laying the foundation in the end of days. And so what that means is we've been able to show that in the end of days, in the midst of the tribulation of seals, the only thing that will get rebuilt in Jerusalem after it's destroyed, because it'll be destroyed after the 50 days, at the start of the 14 years, the only thing that will actually get rebuilt is the foundation, is the physical foundation will be laid during the time of seals. However, in the spiritual sense, in the spiritual foundation of the temple of God, the apostles are laying the spiritual foundation. They are laying the spiritual foundation for what comes after seals and what comes after trumpets. And then it's the millennial reign. OK, so they're laying a spiritual foundation for the people that are being saved and that are coming in during their during their portions of time. And look at what they get. Theirs is where is it they're going to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of god why in the paradise of god well remember at the beginning when we saw the 144,000 are standing on mount zion well what are they doing standing on mount zion if the lord is supposed to be in heaven and this is where you get these crazy ideas that all the, you know, I've heard some crazy ones over the years, some real wild ones. But when you don't understand, you're, 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 you're trying to figure it out. So it's not that I mock them. It's that when I hear them now, I just think, my goodness, that where do you even get that? Because a lot of people will say, well, these are going to be the 144,000 men who, uh, boys who were virgins. Well, of course they were virgins. They were only two years old. So they would say it's it's going to be 144,000 of two-year-old boys and under who were killed when Christ, at Christ's birth. So is it going to be two-year-olds running around coming back to life? Or are they coming back as adults and nobody would know who they were in the first place anyways? Neither is true. These are 144,000 who were on the earth that were being sealed, brought before the Lord and sealed as priests. This is what's happening with these guys. And look at where they are. They're on Mount Zion. And if they're on Mount Zion and they're with the lamb and they're going out with it and they're going out and he's with them wheresoever they go. Then where is this Mount Zion? Well, this is what I was telling you. It's just like John chapter 14. He's returned with paradise. He's coming to receive them unto himself with the place that he's prepared. And that's where the great multitude rapture group goes. He's coming, and that's why he's standing on Mount Zion. We see this in another great example, and I don't, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but we even see it right here. You see the mountain of the Lord, the holy mountain. The Lord is now returned in Zechariah chapter 8. He's on heavenly Mount Zion. It's the mountain of the Lord. You see, a lot of people miss this when they go to Zechariah uh, in the 14 chapters. They miss that it's the Lord there on Mount Zion. It says he's returned to Jerusalem and he's in the midst of it on Mount Zion. When what happens? When they're about to start rebuilding and they're going to what? They're going to rebuild the temple because it's time to rebuild the temple because Zechariah chapter 8 is a picture of the beginning at the first year of trumpets. The last seven years, it's at the beginning. So what would have been laid during seals? The foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid that the temple might be built. This is why he's saying, let your hands be strong now. You guys saw when the foundations were laid during seals. Now it's the time to lay the, uh, uh, now it's time to build the temple. And he goes on to say, look, I couldn't do it before this time. 
Because what? Peace was removed, right? The Holy Ghost was removed. And I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. That's the red horse rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. You see? So where is he? He's on his heavenly mountain, right? Mount Zion. And he's in the midst of Jerusalem. This is what's going to be seen at the end of seals to the start of trumpets. It doesn't mean they're going to see the Lord. He's going to be coming in the clouds, but the world will see what's coming. He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And what is it that he's coming with? He's coming with paradise. So if these guys, the apostles, are responsible for the spiritual foundation, while a physical foundation was also being laid, and then it's the time of the temple to be built, you see, or the and the walls to be built, because that's when the rebuilding of Jerusalem takes place, as well as the temple. It would mean that these guys are done at the end of seals. The apostles work will be over at the end of seals because they're now going to enjoy eating from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Which is precisely what's seen coming at the end of seals. Then you get into Smyrna. So when we went from John chapter 20, we saw how it began the 50 when he returned after the wedding, the eighth day. He meets with the apostles to see what they did with the anointing they were given. And on that same eighth day, he goes now to the Luke group. And this is why you see a different story. Listen to this story. Um, the body of, G of the Lord Jesus wasn't found. And going to the sepulcher. And right here in Luke 24, verse 13, these two guys now show up. And it says, and I beheld two of them went the same day to a village called Emmaus. Okay. Jesus ends up drawing near to them. They didn't know who he was. You know, they're saying, what, where were you that you didn't, you never heard of this guy, right? And there he was talking to them. These are the two that he ends up calling. As we go further down, he ends up calling them his witnesses. There's two of them. Okay. So we started with the apostles being anointed, and now the apostles will be out doing their thing. Are they going to, are they also going to follow the Lord during the 40 days? I don't know. They've already received the anointing of the Holy Ghost, an incredible power and authority being given over them. So maybe they'll meet up with them sometimes, but their job now is this greatest revival that's breaking out in the midst of tribulation. All of this still that I'm talking about is still within the first 50 days, okay? This is just eight days in now. He got a report from them, and now he's going to meet this group. This group that we're reading about, the, the two on the road to Emmaus, these are the two that are in Luke, 24, uh, uh, Luke chapter 12, the first group of watchmen, okay? This is that first group, but you notice that it's only two. He only meets with the two. Do you see the clear contradiction? He's only meeting with two of them, right? He's coming down for a meal, but what did he do with the apostles? It was completely different. What does he do with the, the Mark group that, that represents 144 at the end of Mark? He does something completely different. What do you do at the, at the end of Matthew in, in chapter 28? What does he do with that group? something completely different. It's extremely contradictory if you don't understand the prophetic for the is to come. And that's why Luke chapter 12, when we shared it, was so important. Because what does he do with these two guys? It says in Luke 24, verse 30, it says, and as he sat at me with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. Okay, so he sits down to eat and serves them. Well, this is exactly what he said he would do only with that first group of watchmen when he returned from the wedding. This is them. These two that are the typology in, in the road to Emmaus, this is them. There's two of them. And when we start this, when we started this out and we were looking at this from um, Revelation chapter 7 and the 144,000, we know that Dan and Ephraim are missing. 
So there's something else going on with Dan and Ephraim to have Levi jump in and to have Joseph, Ephraim's father, jump in for his place. Something is happening. There's a representation within these two missing ones that are also directly connected in the prophetic picture to the two on the road to Emmaus who Jesus sits down and has dinner with uh, and serves them a meal who he himself told when he returns from the wedding that he would be the one to sit down and to serve them. Well, he didn't do that to anybody in any of the Gospels except the two from Luke chapter 24. Okay? So you're starting to see that it's this two that he does this with that he called that first group when he returns from the wedding to hang out. And when he returns and he knocks to open to him and he will sit at meat and serve them. Okay. This is that group, but there's only two. You see, we then see a bunch more things. We've covered a lot of this already before breaking bread. They realize who he is. Um, then he returns and he's back hanging out with them again. And then he's going to open up their understanding. We showed how this word understanding here is only used in Luke, and it's connected to the same word of understanding, the mark of the beast. It's pretty awesome, okay? This word right here, it's used 24 times. Watch this. For anybody that's newer and hasn't seen this, let me, let me do it this way. Watch this. Look at that. It's only used in Luke 24. In no other gospel is it used. And so when he opens their understanding, in this word for understanding, look at where it's connected in Revelation 13 and 17. But look at his right here. Let him, let him that has understanding. The only ones that he opened their understanding to are the ones right here in Luke chapter 24. You see why it's so important? You see why in using things like, like the Strong's Concordance and having an e-sword, you realize this revelation within the differences in the Gospels and what things like this tell us? He's opening their understanding of events that are going to be taking place during seals. They're going to understand who the mark, what the mark is, who he is, the Antichrist, everything. It's absolutely phenomenal. And then look at what he says. In Luke 24, 47, it says, um, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. This is the other only thing that happens in Luke. Only in Luke's uh, resurrection story does it begin at Jerusalem, does it say. Why? Because in the end of days, that's where this group is going. They're going to meet the Lord there. And when they get this anointing of the of at the end of 50 days at true at true Pentecost, when they receive this anointing of the Holy Ghost, it's different than the one that the apostles got at the beginning of the 50 days, because they were breathed on by Jesus and they had the power and the authority to do those things right away. This group, who are the two represented by two groups of people, meaning if you have two missing from the 144 and we know that there are two that work during the time of seals and are with the lord during the 40 days we know one is dan one is ephraim we know that that things that take place with dan in relation to judge there's no bad thing okay because dan is the eagle side brothers and sisters okay dan had two representations there was the serpent side and there was the eagle side it, it had two um it had two uh, flags, what do you call them? Ensigns, right? They had two flags, the Dan serpent and the overcoming eagle. So either remain on your belly or you are an overcoming eagle. And it's the eagle who represents the Dan of the workers. And then, of course, the other one is Ephraim. Well, not to go too far down a rabbit trail, but when you go into other books and you even read things like, um, let me show you this one especially for those in the ministry, because we know that Zechariah and Hosea both have 14 chapters, and we've shown that they have the pictures of the chapters to years built within them. 
Well, we know something happens with Ephraim because Ephraim is still around right to the end. He's still around to the end. But when the Lord comes at the end, feet down on the Mount of Olives, he's not going to bring any more burden. Ephraim is forgiven and it's done with. I find that very interesting because what we don't find is anything like this about Dan. And we know that the workers are a group representing Dan and another group representing Ephraim. And there's a reason I mentioned this, and I'm going to say it in passing right now. I'm not going to go into it today, but there's this thing called the Sons of Zadok. And there was a video recently shared with me, and I haven't watched it all, but realizing that there were these Sons of Zadok that were priests brought on. They weren't the Levitical line of priests. Okay, you can see it right here in Ezra 40, verse 46. Uh, these are the sons of Zadok among the sons of Levi, which come near to the Lord to minister unto him. Well, you know why it's interesting? The sons of Zadok in scripture, there were two of them. Hello. There were two of them. And what happened? They had their place in the first temple, which. By the way, if you guys know the prophetic picture, there's there's the time of seals, which is the first temple time. And during the time of trumpets, there's another temple time. And why? Because during the time of seals, it's still us. It's still the physical flesh. The temple's not going to be built because it's still the age of the Gentiles, the, the house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in. It's the physical flesh, which is why it's the time of the mark of the beast, which is why these guys are being anointed with the understanding of these things that the Lord is going to give them to know and to understand so that there won't be any fear, there won't be any of this stuff, and they will understand these things about the mark of the beast. In the time of trumpet judgments, the physical temple will be built, and that's when Satan is cast down and the pit is open, Antichrist is brought back, and he's going to go into the physical temple being built. But during seals, it's, it's the flesh that's still the temple, and it's the mark of the beast being placed on the flesh that is the abomination of desolation in Mark, okay? So there's two temples. So here you even see this first temple period. So this prophetic picture of this, you know, yes, there was that other temple, but it's in, in the prophetic end of days, we know the first temple is like Moses's temple, right? The, the one that was covered in skin and portable, like us, we're covered in skin and we can move around. And then the other temple was the one made of stone. And so in the prophetic end of days, the first temple is the this physical fleshly temple that we're in, okay? And what did it say? These two sons of Zadok, his descendants who held the high priesthood up to the destruction of the first temple and following the building of the second temple, resume, resumed the high priest uh, as per Joshua the high priest, who was also what? With Ezra from the Z Zadok lineage. Zedekite lineage. I found that was very interesting because these two groups, these, this picture, I believe that we're going to be able to pull out of this, of these sons of Zadok who were a part of this priestly line, who were what? In the same lineage as Joshua, the high priest, who we know and have taught is a picture of Christ in the end of days when he comes at the end of seals and he's going to take over for Moses in the prophetic picture and bring them over, cross them over the Red Sea into the place for the great multitude rapture. You see, they're related. They're related. You want to see what I'm getting at? Check this out. We just passed it a few minutes ago. We've covered this many times too. How are they related? Do you think maybe they would be those which are led by the Spirit of God, who are the sons of God? Ver Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself bears witness, witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God, comma, and so heirs of the Father and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. 
who would maybe be a joint heir with Christ, the ones of the this this typology and this lineage? The two in the prophetic typology that were there during first temple time, during this fleshly portable temple time, we're saying in the prophetic. And we know that there were two on the road to Emmaus in the prophetic. Do you know what happens to one of these guys? When Solomon comes and the next temple gets built, then there's an issue with one of them. But I'm going to save that for later on. And so you see this prophetic picture of this one and this, this issue because he's trying to bring somebody else in instead of Solomon, right, to make king. We're seeing this prophetic picture of this Ephraim type. Of this Ephraim type. In fact, let me, I think it's down here. Let me let me show you something real quick with this. Okay. This one, this guy right here, he was removed from being the priest. Why? Because at the time of Solomon, he took part in an attempt to arise uh at a at a to the throne instead of Solomon. Why is this important? How does this prophetically give us a picture of the two on the road to Emmaus? Well, if one is a Dan typology and the other one is an Ephraim picture, okay, we know that something happens with Ephraim. And it's interesting because this, I wasn't planning on going down this road because we know that something happens in relation to the children of Ephraim in the end of days. And here we have it in Psalm 78. It says the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. They turned back in the day of battle. Let me go show you this real quick. The only reason I had that opened is because I was going to build a, a teaching around it. And I just remembered it was there as here I was going into it. See, in, the, in Psalm 78, verse 9, and the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. Look at this. Okay? Turned back in the day of hostile encounter. We've taught that this is the picture of the end of the six years of seals. The seals that, that Ezekiel uh, 39 war, which is the end of seals, the end of the six years of seals, when they see the lamb coming. And that we know that this battle is what we read about in Zechariah 14. Okay? Because in Zechariah 14... Listen to what it says. And remember this battle of Ephraim. Because it says in Zechariah 14, 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided against uh, 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 in the midst of thee, and I will gather all nations against thee to Jeru uh, uh, against Jerusalem to battle, and they will cry and go forth. Okay, So he's got one more battle coming. This is the grapes of wrath, all right? This is the treading of the grapes in Revelation 19. But in, in Zechariah 14, 3, it says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Okay? When he goes and fight against these nations, it's that treading of the grapes, Revelation 19. But then he says, As when he fought in the day of battle. As when? What do you mean? So he's he's got to fight. In the in the end, in the treading of the grapes, when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Yeah, everybody knows that one. Okay, that's Revelation 19. Well, then what was this one? As when he fought in the day of battle. This is Revelation 17. We've been teaching it uh, in, in parts and pieces here and there and mentioning it quite a bit. In fact, the difference between the one in Revelation 17 compared to the one in Revelation 19. That's because the one in Revelation 17 says that it's the lamb. And it's the end of Revelation 6 when it is the wrath of the lamb that's coming. You see, that is the battle. The end of the six years of seals, the Ezekiel 39 war. As when he fought in the day of battle. So who are the ones that he's gathering to come and fight and to, and to be a part of this? Well, it would appear from what we read in Hosea, which is a prophetic picture of chapters to years in the house of Israel, right? With the Gentiles grafted in, we see that Ephraim was still mentioned in the second half of those chapters continuously because he had fallen back. 
And here we are reading in Psalm 78 that this same battle, the exact same word for the as when he fought is the exact same battle that Ephraim was accused for turning back from. Hello. So what do you what do you think I'm seeing with this prophetic picture of these guys? And and the one that that in this picture of the Zadok and these guys, why one was removed? Because he was trying to bring in another instead. And we have an Ephraim, and we've got two workers, Ephraim and Dan, missing. And we know that there's two workers in Luke 14. One, which is a prophetic picture of Dan, one of Ephraim, and we've got all this stuff of Ephraim. And that Ephraim turns away from the time of battle. And one of these Zadok line priests turns away and tries to bring in somebody else instead of Solomon. And then doesn't get brought back in until later. You see, it's this prophetic picture of these two is all over the place. It's given to us everywhere. And they all relate to this. Two on the road to Ephraim. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, to uh, Emmaus. One, I believe, is the Dan line. One is the Ephraim line. I used to say it was quite difficult to find these connections with Ephraim, okay, out of these two workers. The Dan part, <clears throat> excuse me, isn't very difficult. And that's because we have in Romans 16, the Priscilla's and Aquila typology, the two, who are the helpers in Christ Jesus, see, in Christ Jesus, who have for my own life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles. So you have two being represented here as helpers. You get in the picture? Two being represented here as helpers, willing to put their necks on the line to bring in these church, these Gentile churches. When is the church, the, the age of the Gentile church end? At the end of seals, at the great multitude rapture. And why do I say Dan wasn't so difficult? Because of Aquila. Aquila's name means eagle. Dan's symbol is for the non-overcomer being a serpent and for the overcomer lineage being the eagle. So the Dan portion was always quite simple to find as this worker group represents. But now, you know, spend a little bit more time and we're seeing incredible connections to Ephraim as well. And Ephraim turning away from battle because Ephraim is a prophetic picture of some within one of those lines from those two. So when it comes to these two workers, they represent groups of people. Okay, they represent two groups of people. And these two groups, I believe, are Ephraim and Dan. And within these two groups of Ephraim and Dan, I also believe that um, uh, they that the, the numbers that they represent are the same numbers that the 144,000 did. They were a representation of 144,000 that were 12,000 from every tribe. Well, if two are missing, then I would say they probably are a picture of 24,000. 12,000 of Dan, 12,000 of Ephraim. And these are the ones having that will have this meal with the Lord when he returns from the wedding. He will serve them, and, and however that would look, wherever it will take place, this is what's happening with these guys. And yes, one is an Ephraim type, and the other is a Dan. Okay? We know there's a group putting their necks on the line. In fact, they'll probably both, to some extent, put their necks on the line or willingly put their necks on the line. But we know from Luke chapter 21, we know that some of them are going to be put to death. Not all of them, right? We've shared this before in Luke's discourse. This is the group where they're going to be, they're going to be turned on by parents and betrayal and so forth. And some of them will be caused to be put to death. And it's the same some of them being put that will cause to be put to death that we're seeing now after the eighth day, the seventh to the eighth day of the Ephesus group who will remain during seals, we have now the Smyrna group. And this is the Smyrna group, as we've shared many times, representing this group of Luke disciple workers 
when he says, see, and the devil shall cast some of you into prison, okay? That some of you shall be tried after tribulation 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. These guys don't get to the taste of, of paradise. <clears throat> These guys get to take part in the second, de uh, in the second death, meaning they're going to be the ones resurrected to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, they're that priestly line that reigns with them. Well, how fitting is that? Because then we just see that the picture is they're part of the sons of God who are co-heirs with Christ. So as co-heirs with Christ, they're going to be resurrected. So, And that's why they won't be hurt by the second death because they're going to take part in the first resurrection and rule and reign with Christ during the millennial reign. Because they're what? Part of the group that is co-heirs with Christ. The first group of co-heirs with Christ, they went to the third heaven. They're gone, pre-trib. But the remnant workers have a special thing going for them because they were willing to, to be persecuted and to take on all this persecution as Christ did when he was here. And as co-heirs with them, they're going to take part in his millennial reign. Again, this group in the prophetic picture is represented by the 40 days when he returns after the eight-day wedding which was the prophetic picture of Ephesus to the apostles. But both of these groups are here during seals. Okay? So this is, I believe, the 12,000 and 12,000. Two groups of 12,000 from Dan and from Ephraim. I don't think it's very difficult anymore to be able to see this connection with a Dan portion and an Ephraim portion. One of the other connections people often ask is, what we see right here. In the transfiguration story, we see the story that um, uh, 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 ch -ch -ch -ch. they saw Moses and Elias with them, okay? So they see Moses and Elijah. So we've also been able to explain this in the past. There's so many typologies. So it's like, you instead of Moses, you can even say John's, okay? John types, like John the Baptist types. And this, the Elijah's. So you can say Moses and John, the Baptist types. You can say Elijah types. So what do you have again? Well, you have two groups again. Okay, what happened with Elijah? Well, it said some of you will die, not all of you. Okay, so what do we know about Elijah? He never tasted of death at the end of, of his time. And he was taken up, right, in a whirlwind. That's Elijah. At the end of seals, by the end of the six years and the Lord is coming, there he is, and he's not dead, right? He would go up with the great multitude rapture group. And what do we see with Moses? Moses, when he, when, when he dies in the wilderness, it's a picture of when the Lord returns at the end of the six years of seals, when we see the Lamb of God hide us from the face of him and from the wrath of the Lamb, right? From the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. So what do we see? Moses is dead. And Joshua, Yeshua, Joshua, the high priest, is the one who takes them over into the promised land. Just like we read in Exodus. The exact same story, right? The exact same story. Or sorry, from uh, Deuteronomy into Joshua. Who else is Moses this prophetic picture of? Well, we saw it with Priscilla and Quilla willing to put their necks on the line. What happened with the John the Baptist? Remember, John the Baptist is the one who's going to be the picture of restoring father and son, mother and daughter to each other. And then he's going to die for it. Right near the end of the sixth year of seals, same like is the prophetic picture of Moses. And... What do we see again in this prophetic picture? There's no mention of John here. We shared that recently. There's no mention of John in the transfiguration story until Mark's gospel. I thought John was coming first, right? I thought Elijah was coming first, and he was Elijah. It was John, right? And he died. But Elijah never died. Yet John died. Don't you think they would have been scratching their heads after that one? When he tells them in Mark, look at this. When he tells them in Mark chapter 9, 
because this is a picture of the Lord coming at the end of six years of seals. This is the end of the sixth year of seals when they see him coming. And so look at what they say. Okay. I thought that Elias must come first. Ver, uh, ver, uh, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written, the son of man must come. And I say that Elias indeed come, is indeed come. So you have the Elias John the Baptist type. You've got the Moses Elias jo, jo, uh, uh, Elijah type. You see, they're all prophetic types. But Elijah never died. John the Baptist was beheaded. Don't you think they would have been scratching their heads on that one? Saying, but what do you mean? What do you mean he he restored father and son, okay, and doing the baptisms and everything he was doing, but Elijah got to go up in a whirlwind. He didn't have to get his head cut off. Oh, yeah, but it's the same story. <laughs> because we understand there is this prophetic picture within this of this John Elijah, this Moses Elijah taking place. Some will die having put their necks on the line during the time of seals, and others won't die. And it almost seems like the like the like what might happen with those that don't die, as we see, is this Ephraim group, right? So we can also look at it in another prophetic picture, in that, yes, the, the John the Baptist type that puts his neck on the line, and the Elijah type that, that doesn't taste of death, right, that goes up in a whirlwind, is also not only a prophetic picture of these two that we've been talking about the whole time, but they're also a prophetic picture of the rapture group at the end of at the end of the sixth year of seals. It, it, it's both of these things because there will be Christians not not talking about the workers, but those who come to Christ during seals who will be killed for their faith. And there will be those who survive. You see, it's it's the exact reason why in Mark you see these differences, like this word white we've talked about. You know, they had to make their robes white. The word's only used twice. And if you go to the book of Revelation, it's used once in Mark 9, the only gospel it's used in. And in the book of Revelation, we see right here that there were those who were given white robes because these were the ones that were killed. These were the ones that were killed during seals for their faith not the workers not the remnant workers these are the ones that receive the same color type of robe of white robe this one here this long garment robe which is the only one as you guys remember from mark's resurrection story when he sat on the right side the young man sat on the right side clothed with a long white garment it's only the one from Mark 16, and it's directly connected to Revelation 17, uh, chapter 7, sorry. So what are you seeing? You're seeing two groups of people, not the workers. You're seeing those that came to Christ during the time of seals in the greatest revival in human history in the midst of chaos that died having proclaimed Christ. They were given white robes. Comma and mean it's a separation. This is one group. This is another. They're separated and added together. So these are those that died like the prophetic typology of John the Baptist. Not the workers, but just the group of people that come to Christ in this greatest revival ever. And then you've got those with palms in their hands who are the picture of those who made it alive during seals to the great multitude rapture who never tasted of death like the Elijah types. Hello. So this, this Moses, John the Baptist, Elijah picture is extremely prophetic, extremely packed with revelation and end time understanding, not only representing the two as in the worker groups, but also representing the groups of that come to Christ in the end of days in the greatest revival ever. Those represented as who died and those who made it through alive. Okay, so it's got this dual prophetic picture. But what I'm pointing to now 
in relation to talking about it in the worker portion is that these guys are a prophetic picture of the John and Elijah type who are what? Everybody says, well, who are the two witnesses, right? They confuse it because they believe the two witnesses relate to this Moses and Elijah thing. Others will say, well, Elijah never tasted of death, neither did Enoch, so it's the two of them. No, Enoch was just a prophetic picture of the pre-trib bride, and Elijah is a prophetic picture of the mid-trib great multitude rapture. You see, so is the, the Moses John type, though. Unfortunately, the ones that die. Okay, so this is those alive in the prophetic picture. And uh, Enoch is the prophetic picture of those uh, pre-trib. So you got your pre-trib alive, your mid-trib alive. Okay, that's what's going on. But again, this picture in relation to the remnant worker bride, that group that remains, we've got a picture of two. Are they also two witnesses? Yes, but they're not. And this is where I want to make sure it's clear that they're not the two witnesses that really everybody is talking about when it comes to the two witnesses in Revelation 11. Okay? This is not them. These are just the ones prophetically given as the witnesses of the Lord who are what? The two groups. The two remnant groups who remain who will be here during seals, who will follow the Lamb for 40 days, the, the, the prophetic Lord, white horse rider during the 40 days, and remain during seals. This is them. This is them. Look what happens when we go now into Luke 24. In Luke chapter 24, look at what it then says about these guys. Okay? He gave them that meal. He, he served them as he said he would after the wedding. He opens up their understanding so they know of these things now clearly in the end of days and will be able to identify the mark of the beast and everything when it comes. They're to teach repentance. It's going to begin from Jerusalem because they'll be receiving the anointing on the true uh, Pentecost. And the day after, they're going to go out from that anointing from Jerusalem. And the following day, Jerusalem's destroyed and the Jews will be fleeing, will be taken captive, will be gone to the, to the mountains. But look at what it says in the very next verse. In Luke 24, 48, listen to what it says about these guys. You are witnesses of these things. Do you know he doesn't use this term at the end of Mark, at the end of Matthew, in John? He only uses it of these guys. How many were there? Two. They are his witnesses. What type of witnesses, though, are they? They're witnesses of the light. They are witnesses of the light. So they are two witnesses, but they're not the two witnesses as people think of the two witnesses, which we know begins the time of trumpets, and we know who they are. We know prophetically who they are, okay? But they are a type of witnesses, and there's two. Why do I say that they are witnesses of the light? Well, let's go to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, we see in the beginning was the word, right? Who was the beginning? It was Christ. So if we go back to in the beginning, as we've studied many times over the last few years, we can show the entire creation picture as we did here. This seven passing by so quickly it felt like days being this prophetic picture of the first creation, the second creation and the third creation of the flesh. So we know in the beginning was spirit. That was the first creation. The second creation was when he was made light. And the third creation was when uh, the flesh was made and Adam came. Why do you think at Jesus is called the last Adam or the second Adam? Because he wasn't the first when Adam was made flesh. Okay? But when it came to light, Christ was the first one made light. When it was the spirit, it was Christ first in the spirit that created then the rest of everything in the spirit. Because there were three creations. And this is what you're seeing John confirm. So in the beginning was the word and it was the spirit portion. And then what does it say? In John 1, 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness 
and the darkness comprehended it not. There, uh, there, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. Hello. The same came for a witness. Weren't we just talking about these two being a prophetic type of witnesses? Luke chapter 2 calls them witnesses. And there's two of them, of which one is the John the Baptist type. Okay. Uh, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, meaning John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. You see? That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus went from spirit and then was made light. John was a witness to this light who is Christ. When we went back into the beginning of creation, John, remember, John was filled with the spirit from before birth. From conception, he had the spirit in him. Because John is part of this group of the spirit of God in from Romans 8, those who had the spirit of God are the sons of God. Who are they in Romans 8, 1? They are those who are in Christ, spirit-filled. This is the 7,000 or seven days as a whip of time. The, the prophetic picture of the seven years that we're talking about in the end of days, the, the first seven easy that flew by like days. It's a picture of the spirit portion and those being woken up in the spirit. And then what do you see in verse three? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Who was this light, brothers and sisters? This was Jesus. He was spirit and then he was made light. That's what John's telling you. So who is the witness of God making Jesus light? Of the father making God the son light? the ones who had the spirit of God who were part of the spirit realm. So John is telling you in the spirit realm, because he had the spirit from the beginning, that he was what? He came to bear witness of that light. And these two guys are being called witnesses, representing these two groups in the end of days, being called witnesses who are John the Baptist and Elijah types. Or John, Moses, and Elijah types. They were bearing witness to the light. Remember when the Son of Man comes to start his 40 days, when he returns on the eighth day and comes to that Luke group in chapter 24, as these two types, these two witness types, he tells them that they are his witnesses. They're now witnesses. Well, what are they witnesses of? They're witnesses of the light. So if we go to John chapter 8, which we showed is this prophetic picture right at the beginning of the 14 years, look at what we see. <clears throat> Jesus saying he's the light of the world. G John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Who are the ones here seeing this? The ones who bear him witness that he is the light. The only ones that could do that is a group from the spirit realm that remained. This is why John the Baptist came before Christ. This is why prophetic in the end of days, this remnant bride portion remains because they are the ones with the spirit to be witness to Christ coming as the light. When he comes to begin his 40 days. This is why so many people have missed the incredible revelation, the depth of mystery in the creation stories. Because in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, this is God the Father making God the Son light. So when these beings were created, that we find out about down here, and they're making them in their image. There was no flesh yet. They were made in the image of light. 
because the second creation was light because Christ was made light. You see, these are those created, the creatures. This is the Mark group. The seven days is a picture of the 7,000 years, days as thousands. And then when you go to chapter two of Genesis, after the seventh day or 7,000th year typology, days as thousands, then he forms the flesh. Then he forms the flesh. You don't believe it? Just go read John again. Okay, look at John chapter one. We'll just go through it again real quick. The beginning was the word. It was the spirit realm. Okay, Genesis one, verse one and two. Then what happened? John, who was part of the spirit, was witness to the light. So we see it in the creation story. We see it in the is story from when Christ came. And we see it in a prophetic picture in the is to come. Was, is, is to come. All, nothing new under the sun. So here he is, John, as the spirit root group is bearing witness to Jesus coming as the light or in the creation, Jesus being made light by the father, father, God, making son, the God, Jesus, God, light. And then what does it say in verse 14? And the word was made flesh. Who was it in the third creation? It was Adam. The first creation was a spirit. That's why there's only two verses called gap theory. Then you had the seven days, which to the Lord were seven days. But if we were there in time, they would have been 7,000 years. That's what Peter, uh, 2 Peter 3, 8 tells us. And when those seven were done, then the flesh started. But it wasn't Christ. It was Adam. Christ's time came later for the flesh. That's why he's called the second Adam or the last Adam. He was coming to fulfill that portion of the flesh now. It's craziness. But you see, witness to the light. And who is it? John, the one who is the prophetic picture of these remnant workers as the John and the Elijahs. Those who survive and those who get killed. They're the two. They're the same two on the road to Emmaus. Who he opens the understanding to. <clears throat> who he serves. And who he calls his witnesses that will go out from Jerusalem once they receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. How are they his witnesses as witnesses of light? Well, because the second creation that began on day one was when Christ became light. What's that a picture of? It's a picture of what? Seven days and 7,000 years or 7,000 and seven days to the Lord God. It's a picture of seven and seven. Both of them are seven days and seven days to the father because a thousand years is as a day to the father. So seven days and seven days or 7,000 years and 7,000 years. What is it in the end of days? Seven years and seven years. So that means these guys who are the witnesses are the John Elijah types who were witnesses who had the spirit from the beginning so that when he comes to start his 40 days, he's coming as what? as light and he's coming as light like genesis 1 3 for his light group and he told us who they were they're the mark group they're the ones they are the lost sheep of the house of israel who he came to save he did not come for those who were already in christ spirit filled he came to bring and wake up and he's using his witnesses to the light who are spirit filled to wake up everyone who remains in their last chance to come to the true light of the Lord. These are the two groups. <coughs> Excuse me. These are the two, not 144,000 that represent these groups. Do you see any other conversation in here? Do you see any other conversation in here of the 11, of that prophetic picture of, of, of apostles or disciples? Nope. It's just these two. We all know that they're with them, of course. Whoops. 
we all know that they're with him during the 40 days. We go into Acts chapter 1. They were with him to the 40 days till they saw him go up, said not many days hence, which is three more days. Okay? Who, who is it? It's these same two. It's only the two that were with them. They're a prophetic picture of the two, the Priscilla's and the Aquila's, the, the Dan and the Ephraim's. <coughs> and now they're going to be waiting, of course, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And that, of course, comes in Acts chapter 2 at true Pentecost. And that can only happen when true wine is ready, which is any time from September into early October. And that puts Pentecost, true Pentecost, counted from the beginning of the wheat harvest, of the winter wheat harvest, that puts it at the 29th of Elul every year. The mistake in the counts were all about counting the Feast of Weeks from barley and not from the beginning of the wheat harvest, which is called corn in scripture, okay? So now, as we bring this out of the, the two from Luke, I want you to follow this, this storyline along, okay? We saw that it was two, he ate with them, he, he anoints them with the understanding, he tells them they're going to go out <coughs> and, and uh, do all the preaching, and that they are his witnesses because they're just like John, they are witnesses of the light, some will die, some won't. We've seen this all the way through, okay? Well, now look what happens when we go to Mark. Mark's gospel now, and the resurrection story in Mark is the prophetic picture of the end of the uh, six years of seals. It's a prophetic picture of the Lord coming um, on heavenly Mount Zion, okay? We we've broken down so many incredible things, like the name Solome. Solome is this one woman. She, her name only shows up twice, only in Mark's gospel, of course, because it's in the end of Mark 15 and here at the beginning of Mark 16. The reason for her prophetic picture being here is that Herod, um, the, the, it was, was it Herod's wife and, and the daughter and said, you know, I want his, John the Baptist's head on a platter. Her name was Solome. Her name was Solomon. So we're getting this prophetic picture of the timing of John the Baptist and that remnant workers, witnesses of light who represent the two, this prophetic portion of when that group related to being beheaded by Salome had happened. Okay? Now, this isn't that Salome. But in the prophetic, there, there's a reason why her name is only used twice and it's at the end of Mark 15 to the beginning of Mark 6, and at the beginning of Mark 16. It is at the resurrection story of Christ. And the reason is because in Mark 16, in the prophetic, it's a picture of the end of the sixth year of seals when the Lord is seen coming and everybody there is freaking out at the end of the sixth seal. Okay? That's what's happening. Look at what it says. Remember I told you this whole thing with the garment? This word for this long clothing of this garment is the same one that this group is given. So they're going to have this group that died during seals, not the workers, but the those that came to Christ for salvation during seals that came to Christ probably because of the workers and because realizing they missed out and the church had, had not taught them these things and they weren't prepared for the Lord. They weren't really in Christ, spirit-filled. These guys willingly will put their necks on the line and not deny Christ and refuse the mark of the beast. This group is the group that will have hidden out, that will have escaped get it, having gotten the mark. They didn't get it. They hid out in the wilderness and in the mountains and in places of safety during seals, during tribulation, <clears throat> and they will be the alive. Well, remember what I said. It's the same word for the robe. It's the same one, 47, 49. It's only used in Mark. So when he's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, when they see him coming on heavenly Mount Zion, where do we see that? Right here at the end of the sixth seal. Right here at the end of the sixth seal. Here he is, the wrath of the lamb, the great day of the lamb's wrath. And just back here at the fifth seal, what did we see? 
the white robes that these guys were given. There's the white robes they're given for, for having died for, for their faith in Christ. And then there you are seeing them in Revelation chapter 7 at the great multitude rapture. So those that were dead in Christ were given white robes and waiting under the altar. Those that were alive, once it was all done, the great multitude rapture takes place of those who were dead and those who are alive. Now they're there together. And these guys are wearing the same white robes that Christ is seen coming on at the end of the sixth year of seals in the prophetic picture when he's coming in a long white garment. It's incredible. But let's keep reading because look at what happens next. In Mark 16, verse 12, Remember, the, the main focus is to show you that this first group of workers that follow the Lamb for 40 days and work during seals, they are not 144,000. I get the, 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 the picture that you're trying to see that some of you have said in relation to Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. You know, it's like the seventh year and then the 14th year, you know, seven easy, right? And then the, the first 144 and then chapter 14. At the end of seals, there's your second 144. I agree that it, it looks similar to that. We also see that um, that um, David had 288,000 warriors, right? So if you divide that in two, there's 144 and 144. But you could see in everything that I'm showing you, it's all related to these two guys. This, this John the Baptist, Elijah type. These two, the Priscilla's, the Aquila's, the Dan's, the Ephraim's, it's about these two. And you see the issue and why nobody would ever be able to figure these things out is first, it's an anointing from the spirit, right? It, 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 I, it's nothing of my doing. It's all spirit led. And it's the spirit that opens the eyes and the hearts and the understanding of everybody else who's receiving it. Okay. This has nothing to do with me. I've said it so many times. I'm nothing but the mouthpiece. And I am honored to be that mouthpiece. All I want to do is reach more people to see and for them to prepare and understand the revelation. So most people go Matthew, Mark, Luke. Well, if everything you read prophecy-wise, you stop at Matthew. You'll never understand Mark's portion. You'll never understand Luke's portion. But when you go into the rest of the New Testament books, you'll see pre-trib, you'll see mid-trib, you'll see post-trib. And then everybody starts to argue pre, mid, and post, which is it? I used to be part of that debate, you know? I used to be pre, and then I went to mid, and then I thought, well, no, wait a second. That can't be possible because this is clearly talking about pre. So you see pre, mid, and post stuff everywhere. And so what everybody tries to do is because they don't go to the rest of the Synoptic Gospels. They start in Matthew, and that's where they stop. They try to ram it all in to a seven-year period. When in reality, they've missed the first seven years. And they've missed the 50 days. So they ram it all into here. The truth in the end of days is the last will be first. It goes Mark, Matthew, Luke. So if you don't know this, and you're trying to understand prophecy from Matthew, and you're going in to try to discern some of these things as we're doing here, and you're trying to do it from a Matthew perspective, and then go into Mark, and then go into Luke, you'll never be able to do it either. Because it's completely in reverse. It won't make any sense. It'll be like you're going backwards, reversing in time. Let me show you what I mean right here. We just saw Luke. In Luke chapter 24, these two that were on the road to Emmaus, the, the picture of them was he meets with them. They're the first one when he returns from the wedding, everything we've covered. And what happens? They get the anoint. They're with him for 40 days. They get the anointing. They go out during seals. We now know Mark chapter 16 is a prophetic picture of Revelation chapter 6, the very end when the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. Here he is now coming on Mount Zion. We could see it with the time of, of some that were killed. It doesn't mean all of the John the Baptist types, all those 12,000 will be killed, but that some of them will be killed. And then we see this same connection to the long white garment, to those who had them under the altar, and then now they're no longer under the altar. There they are, part of the great multitude rapture. You can clearly see this prophetic picture within the is of what took place in Mark 6. Well, now look at this. Now understanding that this is a picture of the end of the first six years of seals. The Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. Listen to what it says. Mark 16, 12. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them. 
Who do you think these two are? You think maybe they're the same two from Luke? Luke had no other commission of of the 11 or of the of 12 or anything like that. It was only to the two of them. And now here we are in the prophetic picture at the end of the first six years of seals, at the end of the chapter six, the end of the sixth seal, the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion and he's appearing in another form. That's pretty wild, right? He's going to appear in another shape. Isn't that wild? He's going to manifest to them in some shape, but only to the two of them. The representation of the two of that group. This is the reason why I'm telling you, if you went Matthew, Mark, Luke, and you were in the wrong order, you would never be able to discern this. If you go in the true order of the end of days, Luke, Mark, Matthew, it all reveals itself. because. Following from Luke chapter 24, and it was only the two. Here we are now at the end of seals, and there's the two who he's going to appear to in some special form. And what does he say to them? And they went and told it unto the residue. And they went and told it to the residue, the remaining ones, the ones who were to, to leave for lack. These two, who are the same two from Luke at the beginning of the 40 days and during the 40 days of the Son of Man, received the anointing, worked during seals. Some of them were put to death. And here he is in the prophetic picture, that picture of those two groups, some of them still being alive. He appears to them in another form and there to go to the residue, the left behind ones. To tell them what? Well, this time has come. This is now a picture of the end of six years of seals. And look at what he has. You have this quote unquote great commission in Mark 16, verse 14. He says to the 11, listen to what it says. Remember we said in Luke chapter 12, there was the second watch group. Well, these guys weren't ready. The two, the, these two, they were the ready ones. They were the watching, the praying, the diligent. They were girded about, ready to shine his light. They were spirit-filled, and they were ready and waiting for the Lord when he returned from the wedding. Now here they are, some of them that remain until the end of the sixth year of seals, to go tell the residue of what? This next worker group. The Lord's here. Get ready. And listen to this. This is that second watch group. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven. Now remember, it's an is from the events that happened, but it's also a prophetic picture of the is to come. Because listen to what he says. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. And he unbraided, which means he railed on them. Why? Because their unbelief and their hardened heart, the hardness of their heart. You see? He's not sitting to eat with them. They were already sitting and eating. He didn't come and serve them. They were already at, at a meal. And he railed on them because of the disbelief of the two SEALs worker groups who were coming to them, telling them it was time to prepare. He was here. He had just revealed himself to them in another form that only, it was only for them. Who does this group represent? They represent the 144,000. You see, look what happens. This is something we shared a while ago as well in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. You know, in church, we've all been taught it was just the apostles. And then people confuse apostles and disciples. Oh, they're really the same group. No, they're not. They're all different. Look at what it said. So this is the is of what happened from five through eight. And that he was seen of Caiaphas, then of the 12. Okay, there's the 12. That's the Matthew group. Verse six, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present time, but some are fallen asleep. Okay? There's your Mark portion. After that, he was seen of James, then of the all the apostles. Hello. This is the John group. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. This is, this is Paul in the prophetic picture 
Remember, in the end, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, John, and Luke, in the end, it goes Luke, John, Mark, Matthew. You see that? So who do we have here? It's the pre-trib, born out of due time, right? Before she travailed. Isaiah 66, verse 7. Before she travailed, born out of due time. And it's also what? A prophetic picture of him telling that group in Luke chapter 12 that when he returns from the wedding to be ready. And then what happens? Then he meets with the apostles. He meets with them as well right before he goes to the wedding, right? He takes the, the pre-trib group, returns from the wedding, anoints the apostles. And when he returns from the wedding, he meets with the apostle group first. And then he's going to meet with the remnant Luke group workers. And then there's your Mark group. And there's your Matthew group. So when you get to this in Mark, and you see this in chapter 16, and you see that it's the two that he appears to in another form, following the prophetic end time understanding going from Luke into Mark now, here we are at the end of the sixth seal telling the residue, those left behind, here's your next worker group. And he, uh, he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat. So there we go. This is the second watch group. And listen to what he tells them to do. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Remember I said this word? Watch this word for creature. See this original formation? This was the creature creation, which was when they were made light. When they were made in the image of Christ because he had been made light. Okay, watch this. Look at this word creature. Mark, Mark, Mark. See that? Mark, Mark, Mark. And where is it extremely telling for us? In Mark 16, because we know what it represents because of Romans. Remember what Romans said. See, the earnest expectation of the creature, which is the second creation group, waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Waits for this revealing, the, the vanishing, and this anointing of the remaining sons of God. Who are the John Elijah types. See what's going on? Because then it becomes the time of, quote unquote, the creature, that that creation creature. You see, even calls it the creation and creature. This creature part in the creation is the is the connection to that light group, that second uh, uh, portion of creation in the time of the seven days, which was light. So we just saw one of the other ones that was only mentioned in Luke. Now we're seeing this only mentioned in Mark. And we're seeing this direct connection to it. So why would these guys have to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Because that would mean that they're preaching to the great multitude rapture group. This group is helping the great multitude rapture group come in. Because they're what? They're doing this to every creature. And the creature is part of that second creation, which were the ones made of light, which are the lost sheep of the house of Israel that the Gentiles are, craft, are grafted into. So why would these guys be getting sealed as the 144,000 to bring in the great multitude rapture? Well, let's go to Luke chapter 10. Listen to what it says. In verse 1, after these things, the Lord, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before, before his face. See? Before his face. Who was sent out before his face? The 144,000. Into every city and place whither he himself would come. Remember? He follows them or, or he'll be with them wheresoever they go. They follow him wheresoever he goes. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great. What's that talking about? It's talking about the great multitude rapture. The harvest truly is great. But the laborers are few. Why? Because there was only two sets of 12,000. There wasn't this huge number of laborers during the, the greatest revival in human history that will have probably 1.2 something billion people in it of which a few hundred, couple hundred thousand may be dead, 
and the rest that make it alive. So the SEALs workers need a group to help bring in the great harvest because the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. You see? So when we see this and you go to Revelation chapter 7, look at what we see. The 144,000 now being sealed. The 144,000 are sealed before what? Before the great multitude rapture. These guys are sealed at the beginning of the seventh year of seals. The great, which is going to be at around the time of the fall feasts. Okay. In this time frame of the fall feasts, these guys are being sealed to help the workers of seals that remain bring in the great multitude rapture, which will be observed about six months later, approximately, when spring wheat is observed. Because they're the harvest of spring wheat, as we've shared in a number of videos. You see, it's the time of the great multitude rapture, which we know happens at the time of Passover on the second day of Passover in unleavened bread. We even know this, if you remember from, um, from uh, Jeremiah 31. You guys remember this? This why when when... When you're still not sure and, and you waver a little bit as to did we really understand this teaching of winter wheat and spring wheat and that the great multitude rapture is at the time of Passover when it is observed? Well, if you remember this in Jeremiah 31, 8, behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and I will bind and I will blind. Uh, sorry. And with them, the blind and the lame. The woman with child and her that travail together, a great company, a great multitude shall return thither. Now, why was this a big deal? Because when you go into the original translation of the of the Hebrew into Greek, it's the Septuagint. It literally tells you Passover. Can you believe it? It literally, in the very first translation from hebrew it tells you which is the septuagint it tells you it's passover and here we are having revealed that the great multitude rapture is observed as spring wheat at the end which is at the fall feast is when spring wheat is ready but it isn't observed until the second day of passover when he's gathered this great company. It's the same thing we've taught on before, right? With um, with Ezekiel. You know, you got the Ezekiel 38 war, and then they're what? Uh, um, uh, burying the, the dead for seven months, right? So you're in that six, seventh month range, and bang. So those that come from far away, it won't be first Passover because they were covered in what? If they were helping bury the dead, then you have blood on your hands. So if you were near a dead body, it tells us in um, in Habakkuk chapter two, I believe, you know, in the priestly order of things that if they're near a dead body, they they can't come to the first Passover. Right. They have to get cleansed and so forth. And they would go now to the second Passover. Right. So first or second Passover, it's one of these two. And maybe it's the first. And then there's still come some coming because of being near dead bodies, that it would be the time of second Passover for the rest of the group. But it's right there. It's right there. So again, this is what we're seeing here in Mark chapter 6. Now, that's Mark chapter 16. So we now see that they're helping bring in all the creatures that the light was, sh was shining on. And it says, he that believe and that baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not is damned. So now this group didn't have to be baptized. Okay? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believes not shall be damned so you have to believe of course but you don't have to be baptized why well if you remember this group is going to paradise this is the great multitude rapture going to paradise when the lord comes on heavenly mount zion he's going to paradise 
I mean, these guys are going to paradise, the rapture group. So they don't need to be baptized. If you remember in Luke chapter, is it Luke chapter 22? In Luke chapter 22, you remember the one on the cross next to Jesus, right? And he tells them because right at the last minute, or is it 23? He tells right at the last minute, he didn't have time to be baptized, right? So he, he just before his death, he, he was repentant and he turned to the Lord and said to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And what does he tell them in Luke 23, 43? And Jesus said unto him, verily, I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Do you know what this is a picture of? This is another teaching, a group of teachings we did a while back. We remember that when Christ is on the cross, the one on his right side is the one that repented here and that Christ said would be with him in paradise. And the one on the left wasn't. So you've got a picture of Christ in the middle. Okay. The spirit filled light, like the John group, the pre-trib group on his right side, the first one, you have the, the one who repented and was now going to be going to paradise, like the great multitude rapture group. And then you've got the one on the other side who was left till the end, right? And didn't repent. What is it a picture of? Pre with Christ, mid with, with Mark, and post with Judah. It's the pre, mid, post, but where does it begin? In the middle. Christ, those in Christ's spirit filled who are the sons of God. So if you go to the three feasts of the Lord and it says Passover and then Feast of Weeks and then Tabernacles, and you look at the middle one, Feast of Weeks, Christ, pre-trib group, then you go to the one that was first, which was Passover, unleavened bread, there's your second group, and they're going to paradise, and then you got your third group connected to Tabernacles, and there's, when he returns, feet down after the prophetic typology of the seven of Tabernacles, and then the great eighth day. You see how awesome it is? We can connect these things to the feasts of the Lord. We can connect these things to the creations, to the Gospels, to many different sections within the Gospels, to the picture of the end of days. And it's all directly related to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Those in Christ above 14 years are going to be like a rapture to the third heaven. Then I knew another man, kind of like the first, but not really, because it's like the first man, not in Christ like the first one, how he was caught up. This is the Harpazo, great multitude rapture, to paradise. And then you've got the third one when he says, the third time I'm coming to you. First taking, feast of weeks, in the middle of the feast, going to the third heaven, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled. The second group, kind of like Christ, the rapture of the great multitude, the spring wheat, which will be ready and observed at Passover time, which is the group going to paradise, directly related to the one on his right on the cross, and then his return feet down. So awesome when you can see these things. It's just, it's a mind melt of if you're new and you're hearing this and you're still somehow following along, congratulations, because it is incredible. A lot of rewiring of, of previous thoughts of understanding but the books have been opened here in the last six years, uh, preparing a people for the end. So we've covered that now. So now we know why they're doing these things, because they're helping bring in the great multitude rapture in Mark 16. And then it says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And, it, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why does this group have all of this power and ability given to them? Why are they protected to be able to take up serpents and no deadly thing hurt them? Because now they're being given the power that when they work trumpets, okay? The Lord comes at the end of seals. He seals them. He has He has the, the two from seals remaining. Go to them. These guys, he unbraids on them, but they're going to be his workers now. They're the 144. They're the second watch group from Luke 12. 
they help bring in the great multitude rapture. That group is going to paradise. And now he says these signs and these abilities they're going to be able to do. Why? Because now they're going to be working the time of trumpets. So this is what I was talking about near the beginning. Because in Revelation chapter 7, this is when they are sealed and they help bring in the great multitude rapture. Once this is all done and they've brought in the great multitude rapture with the remnant of those workers, then we go to Revelation chapter 14. And here we see them standing on Mount Zion with the lamb, having his father's name written in their, written in their foreheads. They sing a new song. They're the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. These were virgins. These are they which go. Uh, uh, these are they which follow the lamb wheresoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men. Being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. Okay. There were two first fruits groups. When you go to Romans 16, you see the Priscilla and Aquila and those that were in their homes. That's one group. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 16, you see there was another first fruits group. One's the seals workers. One is the picture of the 144, these guys right here. And what did it say? That they follow him wheresoever he goes, right? He's with them. So wherever they go, he's going to be with them. Because at this point now, the lamb, Christ, is high priest and king. Remember, he was seen coming and he was coming on heavenly Mount Zion. What is this heavenly Mount Zion? We all read about it. We spoke about it recently as well. In Daniel chapter 2, with the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It's the whole story of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. It's all about a prophetic picture, a prophetic picture for the last days. And then what does he say? I saw till that a stone was cut without hands, which stone smote the image upon the feet that was of iron and clay and break them to pieces. And it all came crashing down. And then it says in the last portion of verse 35, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. <clears throat> so again, this is that picture of the lamb coming at the end of Revelation 6. And it's exactly the battle that we read in Revelation 17. These shall make war with the Lamb. Who? We see in Revelation 17, 12, the ten horns. They're the prophetic picture of the statue with the ten toes. They give their power unto the, unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb. See? With the Lamb. And the Lamb's going to overcome them. This is when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. This is that battle that we were talking about that Ephraim turned away from. Aha. Uh -huh. Why did Ephraim turn away? I don't know yet. I don't know what the prophetic implication is. But this is the one that prophetically Ephraim turns away from. Okay? This is the first war, which is the Ezekiel 38, uh, Ezekiel 39 war. This is exactly what we're reading about. This is this is from uh, um Daniel chapter 2. And what did it say? That that stone became a great mountain. Well, if we come to Zechariah chapter 8, like we showed earlier, and we now know that all of these things were happening at the end of the 6th to the and during the 7th with the 144 and, and the great multitude rapture in the 7th year, not that it's all laid out in, in Zechariah. Zechariah is to the Jews. But we see this taking place in the seventh year, and then we come to chapter 8, and here's the Lord on heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord, talking about, as we said earlier, the foundations that were now laid, spiritual and physical, so now that the city and the temple and the street, right, that the temple might re be rebuilt, and the wall, because now this is the days that the, the rebuilding will take place. There's no more nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. The Lord defeated the Antichrist. That's what we read in, in Daniel chapter 7. And that's when the Lord makes a covenant now 
if you kept reading down Jeremiah 31 after that time of the great multitude rapture, you keep reading and he makes a covenant. That's the prophetic covenant he's going to make. I believe it's going to be made in the seventh seal. That that covenant is going to be made. And all of this is a prophetic picture of the first year of trumpets. And he's there on Mount Zion, not feet down on the Mount of Olives. And this is after he destroyed the enemy, after uh, uh, the, 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 the ten kings that gave their power, the ten toes, and everything was smashed. It's exactly... What we read about and have spoken about before in Second Esdras. Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those that are on the earth. This is the pre-trib bride of Christ right here. Verse 30. So this is chapter 13, starting in verse 29. And here's 30. And bewilderment of mine shall come on all those who dwell on the earth, and they shall plan to make war against another, war against one another, city against city, place against place, people against people, kingdom against kingdom. This is your nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, beginning, which is at the red horse rider. At the end of the 50 days, and it begins with the attack on Jerusalem to start the 14 years. It says, and when these things come to pass and the signs occur, which I showed you before. So now he's skipping through all of these things that happened during seals. And he goes to the end of the six years of seals. And my son will re be, uh, uh, will be revealed, whom you saw as a man coming up from the sea and... When all nations hear his voice, every man shall leave his own land and the warfare they had against one another. And an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together, as you saw, desiring to come and conquer him. This is the beast and his ten kings and those armies with him. Listen to what it says next, verse 35. But he shall stand on top of Mount Zion. And Zion will come to be made manifest to all people prepared and built. Exactly what it says only in Mark when you go to the Last Supper. Prepared and built. As you saw, a mountain carved without hands. What did it say in Daniel? A stone carved out that came and smashed it and became a great mountain. It's Mount Zion, brothers and sisters. And there you see, so then you see another multitude that was peaceable. These are the 10 tribes. Who are the 10 tribes? The house of Israel. The house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in. Who were taken captive in King Hosea, uh, uh, Shulamanser, the king uh, uh, of the Assyrians. Okay. This is what you see. And then you even see some travel time in here. Very interesting. Okay. This is the first six into that seventh year of seals in the great multitude rapture. You want more evidence that it goes longer? Just follow it through. End of chapter 13, verse 58. And because the governor of the times. And whatever things come to pass in their season. And I stayed there three days. So after those seven, now he's got three more days. This puts you in the midst of trumpets in the prophetic picture. And what happens? After those three days, he's now talking about mid trumpets in the prophetic picture. And here's what he's told. I think this is chapter 14, verse 16. For evils worse than those which I have shown, which I have now seen happen, shall be done hereafter. Why? You're at mid-trumpets. The pit's about to be open. Satan's going to be cast down. The pit's going to be open. Antichrist comes back. All of the things coming out. It's going to be worse than the mid-trib with the Antichrist alone with the false prophet. This is now going to be worse. For the weaker the world becomes through old age, the more shall evils be multiplied among the inhabitants. Evils worse than you had already seen in those first seven are now coming at mid-trumpets. Not during the first half of trumpets. And we know it's not during the first half of trumpets because the Lord is here and the city and the street and the temple is being rebuilt while they're there on Heavenly Mount Zion, on paradise. They're there with the place prepared. And now the city and the streets and the temple get rebuilt. This is all related. Every part of this is connected to the storyline we're talking about. Remember what we said now? We see that they're given power because of these things they're going to have to deal with during trumpets because they're the trumpets workers. They help bring in the great multitude rapture, but now their work is trumpets. 
And what does it say in Mark 16 as it comes to an end? Uh, verse nine and 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Again, why is this important? We've talked about this one a number of times. But in Psalms 110 is the most crystal clear example of what this prophetic timing is. The Lord said unto my Lord, so the Father said unto the Son, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Okay? When is this? The end of seals to the start of trumpets. See, when he comes with the rod of iron that we read about in Revelation chapter uh, 12, in verse 5, he came with the rod of iron. He comes, and then you see the great multitude rapture take place. And then what does he become? He comes high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the high priest, who is this high priest Melchizedek? Who's seated at the right hand of God? We know it's the son. But what is the prophetic picture? He's the high priest. And we know that this high priest is a prophetic Joshua Yeshua picture. And what was he? Well, the prophetic implication was through that Zadok priestly line. Okay, not that Christ is, but the prophetic picture in the typology of who Joshua is portraying in the book of Zechariah, who is the Lord. Because remember, in the prophetic picture in in, uh, in Zechariah chapter six, we know that it's um, Joshua who is the high priest. And we know that that Joshua Yeshua is a prophetic picture of the Melchizedek high priest. When? At the end of seals, when he's now seated at the right hand of God. You see what I'm saying? There's no way you can comprehend these things if you're going Matthew and trying to pick apart everything in Scripture to fit it in seven years. It will never make sense. That's why there have been so many questions that people have had. And if you tried to go Matthew, Mark, Luke, you'll be just as lost because you're going in reverse. Now listen to what it says in Mark 16, verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Who is the only group that the Lord says this type of wording to? The Lord working with them. Why? Because now he's high priest and king. If he's high priest and king and the 144,000 of the priests that are working during seals, I mean, during trumpets, doesn't it make sense that the 144,000 who follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes, because he's now high priest and king, he's leading over them? We showed this the other day and in, in, in times past, just like in the chapters to years. You go to chapter 15 of John, and in chapter 15 of John, you see Jesus now switch his tone and say, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. It's now all about fruit. It's all about fruit. Because he's now talking to the fruit workers, the grape worker time, which is the time of the workers, the 144 during trumpets. See, a completely different conversation in Luke's resurrection story compared to Mark's. We know precisely who these guys are. We saw the prophetic picture of them when they were sealed in Revelation 7 so that they helped bring in the great multitude rapture. We then see when they get these additional abilities given to them after they've been sealed, and it's the prophetic picture of the Lord there with them on Mount Zion because that's what he came on at the end of seals to, to bring in the great multitude rapture to paradise. And these who are sealed are the priestly line or are the, are the priests, the 144,000 who are being anointed to go out during trumpets and will need the additional power when the pit is opened at mid trumpets after the city and the streets and the temple and the wall has been rebuilt. You see, remember the wall is rebuilt in Jerusalem during the first half of trumpets as well. So you've got the city and streets and the wall and the temple gets rebuilt during the first half of trumpets. 
That's who the, the modern day Zerubbabel and Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus, the high priest and king. That's why he's there with them on heavenly Mount Zion. It's not up in, in, in the imaginary heaven. It doesn't mean everybody's going to see it. I don't know if it's in the clouds. I have no idea what it's going to look like. And they're being sent out. This is your 144,000. But I really wanted you to make sure you saw this connection. That from Luke, it was only the two. We know who they represent. We know all the typologies of them. And that there will be some from both of them when he comes at the end of six years of seals. And this is his sons of God, uh, uh, co-heirs with Christ. And they're with him until what? Till the end of seals at least, and they're to go tell the 144, hey, time to get ready, you're going to come help us. And he unbraids on them with the second watch group. Now watch this. Now watch what happens as we start to wrap this up here and we come to Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, we now see, watch this, Okay, let me see. Da, 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 da. We saw the raiment. He's coming as lightning, right? Because we know when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of the sixth year of trumpets or at the end of the the 13th year of tribulation, Satan, when, when Matthew's discourse, abomination of desolation takes place, we know that's when Satan was cast down, the pit was opened, Messiah, Jesus was cut off, and... Satan has two and a half years, which brings it to six years of trumpets. And then the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And what do we know happens? Well, we know he's coming as lightning from one end unto the other. That's exactly what we're seeing here. Just like when you go to the discourse in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 27, that he comes as lightning from one end unto the other. It's exact picture. We also see it in. In Luke 17, verse 24, 25, he talks about when he's coming feet down in his day as lightning from one end to the other. And listen to what it says. He's now coming to, well, there's something before that, though. <clears throat> I thought I had the word highlighted. Da -da 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 -da. There it is. Let me make this dark blue. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 12, it says there was a great earthquake and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Okay, so now you've got, again, no Salome. You have a, a completely different conversation going on, and it was a great earthquake. Why is this a great earthquake, do you think? Well, what if we go look up this word? Okay, there's the word for great. Okay, let's go look up great earthquake together watch what happens great earthquake okay ta-da only in matthew chapter 28 and what is matthew 28 it is a prophetic picture in the typology of when he comes feet down on the mount of olives right at the end of the 13th to the start of that 14th this is when he returns feet down on the mount of olives and it's only in Matthew chapter 28, of all the Gospels, just like we showed with the event with Luke, just like we showed in another event with Mark, here we are showing in another event with Matthew, the word great earthquake is only in Matthew chapter 28 out of all the Gospels. And look at Revelation 11, chapter 13. What is Revelation 11, chapter 13? Remember, what's the timing of where we're at in the prophetic timeline? We're talking about a period of time, right, as I said earlier, right on this line, right on this line. It's like John chapter 20 in the picture of the Lord returning. It's, it's, the, it's, it's right at the end of serving 20 years and making then a covenant. You see, when we know Christ makes a covenant in the seventh year of seals, at that seventh seal, in the latter portion of the seventh year of seals, he has to break it when Satan is cast down and he's cut off and the pit is open. This is why we're saying in Jeremiah 31, when I mentioned that, it's right at the end 
right on this line between 13 and 14, when it comes to an end, he returns feet down. He's completed those years, and he's going to renew the covenant that he made right before trumpets. And so what are we seeing here? It's right at the end of the 13th year. Okay, this is where we are in the prophetic timeline when Satan's now being, uh, uh, Satan's had his two and a half years and the Lord was cut off and now he's about to return, feet down on the Mount of Olives and the prophetic picture is only found in Matthew with the great earthquake and what happens when we go to Revelation 11 and we go to the end of the sixth, uh, sorry, of the, uh, uh, yeah, of the sixth trumpet. What's the sixth trumpet? The sixth trumpet is the second woe. Remember the first four trumpets, and then it tells us in Revelation 8, Revelation 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then what does it say? And behold, right, there's three more trumpets coming called woe, woe, and woe. So when we go to Revelation 11, <clears throat> and we're seeing two woes have passed, that means the fifth and the sixth woe have passed. These played out, these two woes are the two and a half year time of Satan and his rule on earth once Messiah is cut off after the temple and everything's built. And listen to what it says. Right at the end of it, right at the very end. Revelation eleven thirteen, And the same hour. So we're talking within like an hour of the end of the 13 years. In the same hour, was there a little earthquake? A great earthquake. And the tenth part of the city fell in the earthquake, and the seven, uh, um, and of men, seven thousand, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was passed. And as soon as this second woe was passed, so within what? Minutes, an hour? Do you know exactly? You want to see how immediate it is? Look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, at the coming of Christ, it's not pre trib, it's not mid trib. It's the post-trib when he's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. Look at what it says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So what do we see? Here we are at the end of 13 years. There's this great earthquake, and the seventh trumpet is about to sound. What is this great earthquake? Well, soon as that seventh trumpet sounds, the mystery of God is over. He's now come as lightning from one end to the other. There was a great earthquake, and he's come as lightning from one end to the other. What is this great earthquake at the end of 13 years? It starts, right, the end of 13 to the start of the 14th. It's the day of the Lord. It's now the beginning of the final year, right at the time of the final year of tribulation. And what do we see? When he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives. And there's obviously a great earthquake because it cleaves in the midst towards the east and towards the west. A very great valley. This is that great earthquake. It's the same one from Matthew 28. It's the same one from the, the end of the sixth trumpet at the end of 13 years. And now you see the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. When in all of your prophecy bible teachings at any point of hearing teachings have you ever heard of the lord coming on mount zion in all the years that i had heard and studied on it before i started getting revelation i never heard of it never they like going to zechariah 14 but they're not big fans of going to this in zechariah 8 because when did the lord come on heavenly Mount Zion to gather the people back to start building the temple on the foundation. When there was affliction, he set everyone against his neighbor. You see? He says, I am returned unto Zion. It'll be the mountain of the Lord in Jerusalem, in the midst of Jerusalem. You see? This, this, is, this is the stuff that everybody misses. And it's all because of Matthew. So now as we come to the end of this with Matthew, we now see another group. So we saw all these connections. 
we saw the great earthquake, the angel descending. Okay, this is returning as lightning from one end unto the other. It's feet down on the Mount of Olives. And now he's coming. We got this report of the guard. You see, and the Jews, among the Jews, is reported this way unto this day. You see, because it still is, isn't it? Now listen to this great commission. Oh, wait a second. Remember I said my focus was about the two that started from Luke, and they were the only ones in that entire storyline for the 40 days going right in through through seals? We saw them then in Mark at the end of six years of seals. They were still there, some of them at least, and they went to tell the 144, and they, they weren't ready. They were that second watch group, right? And he, he, unra he unbraids on them. But we still saw the two. Now here we are. Now we're coming to the end. It's the end of the six years of Trump. It's the end of 13 years. The Lord has returned feet down. And we don't see anything about the two. How about that? Where are the two? There's no mention of them whatsoever. There is no mention of them. There's not even a mention of the other 11. You see, the other ones were the 11. Now it says the 11 disciples. There's this distinction between these different groups. Now, when he comes to this group, it says, then the 12 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Remember what I said? It's going to roll around all the way back to John chapter 20. Because John chapter 20 isn't only a prophetic picture of the beginning in the typology of how it plays out. But when it all comes back to the end, when the Lord returns at the end, feet down on the Mount of Olives, like chapter 20 of John in the big picture. This line I was telling you guys about right from the beginning. This is the picture of when he returns. That's why John chapter 20 says when he when he rises again from the dead. And then we see, listen to what he says. He didn't serve them. He didn't come have a meal with them. They weren't having a meal. We saw in 1 Corinthians 15 that there was more than one group. There was 12. There was a large group. There was the apostles. <clears throat> and then there was the Luke group. You've probably all thought your whole life it was the 12 apostles. And then there were some disciples that followed. No. There was 24. There was 24. There was two sets of 12 and a group of disciples and followers. That's precisely what you read about in 1 Corinthians 15. And so what are we seeing here? We're seeing the third group that he talked about in Luke chapter 12. At the third watch. And now here he is coming. He's returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. They see him in what? Some doubted because it's like doubting Thomas. It brings us all the way back to the prophetic in John chapter 20 when doubting Thomas is there. You see, why is doubting Thomas there? Remember, doubting Thomas came on the eighth day when he got to see him. On the eighth day. Do you remember? It started with a wedding. And it's going to end with a wedding. It's going to end with a wedding, right? And that'll be on the eighth day of tabernacles, not the same as the first seven days of the wedding in the 50-day count of the pre-trib, but this will be the Jewish wedding at the end. And listen to what it says. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Well, if you go to Revelation 11 again, and you go to, to the seventh trumpet, when Revelation chapter 10 said at the beginning of the seventh trumpet, everything will, will be revealed. It's over. It said, Lord Almighty, which are his eyes, the grave of the rain. Verse 18 of Revelation 11. And the nations were angry, um, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that thou should be judged, the prophets. Okay. Oh, yeah. And he says, uh, where is it? That everything. Oh, it's further up. Right here in verse 15. 
And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You see, this is the exact same picture you're getting. He's now returned. It's, it's feet down on the Mount of Olives, and it's also what? Well, they just they were just complaining that it was now the time of his wrath. Because at the time of his wrath, it's then Revelation chapter 19, just like Zechariah chapter 14 said, you know, that now he's going to go to battle as when he did. And that first battle is the Ezekiel 39, the Revelation 4, uh, 17, which was the wrath of the lamb. But now we come to this one and this war that he makes is his vestiture dipped in blood. And what does it say? Verse 15 of Revelation 19, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This is the wrath of God, which is the grapes of wrath, the winepress of his wrath, and it's the one that Zechariah chapter 14 is talking about that is now about to take place. Not like the one, but as the one, as when he did at the end of the sixth year of seals. One at the end of the sixth year of seals, one at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. One is the wrath of the lamb. The other one is the wrath of almighty God that the, that the son is pouring out in that final year, because that final year is the day of the Lord and the year of his vengeance, okay? In Matthew 24, we see this commission, which is totally different, and now you see he's got now power, all power on earth and in heaven is given unto him. So when this happens, it's said in Revelation 11 at the seventh trumpet that now everything in heaven and on earth, everything's now his, and he's now ruling forever and ever. Well, listen to what it says. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. No one, nobody's preaching anymore. In Luke, they were preaching. In Mark, they were preaching. This is what? This is that third watch group. So who is this third watch group? They're the 12 tribes. This is relating to the 12 tribes. Just as you read in Matthew's discourse, when all the tribes will mourn, these are the heads and the tribes that are going out to teach the nations no longer preaching. Why isn't the word preach used? Because preaching is done. Now the whole world will have seen him come. The mystery of God is over at the beginning of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, like Revelation 10 says. So now they're going to teach the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You see, this wasn't for us. Ours is the Acts Chapter 2, verse 38. So what do we see? Now they're going to go teach the ways of the Lord, and they're going to baptize the people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then Matthew 28, 20 ends, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Why is he here till the end of the world? Because now he's here till the end of the millennial reign. It's not a it's not a figure of speech and and him being within us, you know, in the is. Yes. But in the revelation of the end of days, all these mysteries hidden within the Gospels, it's prophetic to the end of days when he is returned feet down and he will teach them his ways and they will go out baptizing and teaching the people, all nations of his ways so that they will know how to observe them and his feasts, and his times, and so forth, according to his ways. And he's with them now until the end of the world. This is that third group. So you saw the Luke group, which was the first one they ate with. You saw the second group, the 144, that he unbraids on. You saw that the first group of two were the ones that come to get the 144,000 who are going to help them bring in the great multitude. Then you see the end of the time, the great multitude, and you see the next group, which relates to the third watch, and they're the workers that are going to go out during the millennial reign of the 12 tribes. They're not the ones from the first two workers that are resurrected to rule and reign with Christ. These guys are going out to teach 
the ways of the Lord to the world that remains, to the nations during the millennial reign. So if the apostles were one group, not of those three watches, but stood on their own first, and they related to foundations, and the 144,000 are going to work during trumpets while the city and the street and the temple gets rebuilt on the foundation that was laid during seals in the physical time and the spiritual time. And the 144 working during trumpets is when the wall of the city is getting rebuilt and they're the spiritual walls being built during trumpets. Who are these guys? These guys represent the spiritual gates during the time when people of these nations, when they come to worship the Lord, will be entering the gates through the 12 gates of the 12 tribes. So now when you go to Revelation chapter 21, it'll all make sense. Because here's New Jerusalem coming. And when New Jerusalem comes, New Jerusalem has 12 foundations, has wall, has the wall, and has 12 gates. Who are the foundations? There you go, the 12 apostles. So they were laying a spiritual foundation during seals, and there was a physical one literally also being laid, revealed in scripture during the midst of seals. When the foundation is done and the time of seals are over, it's now the time of trumpets. <laughs> Excuse me, trumpets. And we know, that was a weird one. And we know during the time of trumpets, the city and the streets and the wall gets rebuilt and the temple. And look at the measurement of the wall. It's 144 cubits according to the measurement of a man that is of an angel. So you've got this picture of the 144,000 during the time of the walls or the wall during trumpets. They're building a spiritual wall during trumpets while the physical wall is being rebuilt along with the city and the temple until, of course, Satan is cast down and goes into that physical temple, right? The, the, a, a built temple. So there's your there's your your apostle group from John, Gospel of John. There's your 144,000 from the end of Mark that will work trumpets. And then you've got the 12 gates which are the names of the 12 tribes. There's your worker group at the end of Matthew's gospel who are going to teach and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost who are gone out during the millennial reign and they're the gates through which everybody who will come to observe the Lord on his appointed times will come in through the teachings of the tribes and enter through the gates represented by the tribes. The only thing that's missing in all this is the first watch group from Luke. So we saw the apostles related to John. We saw the 144 related to the Mark group, the end of Mark, right, that will that will be taken from Mark and work during trumpets. We see the end of Matthew and the 12 tribes that will work during the millennial reign. The only thing we're missing is the Luke group who remained that those two as that worker group putting their necks on the line, some dying, some not. This Ephraim and, and Dan type, they're not in here. And the reason they're not named here, many of you guys know this, is because in Revelation chapter 20, which relates to Revelation chapter 2 with Smyrna, we know that Smyrna are the ones from Luke during the 40 days with the Son of Man and then here during seals. Their reward, as you see, they have a crown of life but they shall not be hurt by the second death. They're the only group told they won't be hurt by the second death, and they're the ones that put their necks on the line to help bring in the, the Gentile churches. And in this putting their necks on the line, not as those who just came to Christ and died for their salvation, but those who went out as workers and died for it, they have part in the first resurrection, you see? Blessed is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. So the only people that won't be hurt by the second death are those who took part in the first resurrection. 
And the only ones that take part in this first resurrection so that second death won't hurt them are those who never took the mark of the beast as that remnant worker group. Even though others won't and they'll die for it, this is specifically directed to the Luke group workers because it says they shall be priests. Hello. Remember they were priests? They were the ones like the John the Baptist, the priests like the Moses types, right? But the John the Baptist, this, this priestly line, potentially like these, the, these two of the Zadok group, they're the priestly, a, a priestly line that was brought in, and these will be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. All four groups of workers covered in the very end of days from the, from the apostles for the foundations during seals to the seals workers putting their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles, whose reward will be having part in the first resurrection to reign with them as priests during a thousand years. The 144 relating to the walls who are building the spiritual wall while a physical wall is being built. And finally, those who are going to work during the millennial reign who will be here with these guys, not because they're taking part in the first resurrection. It's they haven't even died yet during tribulation. The workers of the of the millennial reign are from the 12 tribes that survive. They won't need to be resurrected. They're the workers going out to teach during the millennial reign the ways of the Lord. And the priests are the ones reigning with Christ for the thousand years, not going to going out and and preaching and or, uh, going out and teaching the ways of the Lord. These are the ones reigning with them during the millennial reign while the 12 tribes are out teaching the ways of the lord so that when they come to worship and when it's time to worship they do so properly you see how awesome that is do we see another group of 144,000 we don't see 144,000 except the ones representing the walls when new jerusalem comes we know that the walls from Daniel, from Daniel chapter 9, you know, we've broken down Daniel 9. You could see it in, in our intro videos. It's not about seven years. It's about 14. However, you can say it's kind of like seven because it's these first seven that pass by first, okay? That they're going to rebuild Jerusalem, but not until after these seven weeks that relate to seven years. Then. It'll be about three and a half years. And what gets rebuilt? The city, the street, and look at what it says. The wall. What did it say in Revelation? The wall. It doesn't even say walls. It says the wall. And when these about three and a half years are done, Messiah is cut off. Just like we said, about mid-trumpets, he's cut off. Why? Because the people of Prince that should come with a great flood to the end of the war, because the two war breaks out for two and a half years against two witnesses. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, they fly away in the wings of an eagle for a flood for a time and times and half a time. It's the final three and a half years. But two and a half of those final three and a half is the war with Satan against the two witnesses. And then you've got one more year. This is that final year that we spoke about where Jesus confirms the covenant that he made. In this final year, he reconfirms, he confirms that covenant that he made at the end, at the very end of seals to begin trumpets. You see? It's awesome. It's all there for us, guys. <clears throat> it's all there. We saw the wall. Was there any other piece within this that relates anything to a wall? Only during the first half of trumpets. If the 144,000 represent the wall, why isn't there some wall being built during the first seven weeks? What? Wh where's the rest of the story of another 144,000 being this worker group during seals and not the just the Priscilla's and Aquila's or the 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 um john and elijah's 
right? Or the 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 Dans and the Ephraims. It's all throughout scripture with this with this picture of two. And now I was just able to show you when they start and where their time appears to come to an end, even though they may remain, there might be something more, which is why their portion and their story is different. But clearly, at least their portion is during the 40 to the very end of seals, to say the least, maybe more. But anything related to the 144 is always the wall. So when now we can go back into Revelation and understand that this is where they're sealed in Revelation chapter 7 to then help bring in the great multitude rapture. And then when you get to 14, it is after they've been sealed and brought in the great multitude rapture that now they're about to go out and with the son following the lamb, right? Following wheresoever he goes. And hopefully now for those that are newer, you can see that the Lord coming on Mount Zion is the time of the end portion of seals for the great multitude rapture. And the Lord will be there on Mount Zion while the city and the streets and the temple and the wall are being rebuilt. And that will be the beginning of trumpets. It is not the Antichrist who builds the temple. Not at all. It is not possible that he would build the temple. The Lord will be here during the building of the temple, overseeing as the high priest with the greatest authority connected to the Father. While he has the 144 with him and the workers and modern day Zerubbabel, who is the one who will lay the foundation in the first half, I believe in the first half of seals. When he lays that foundation, he's the one that scripture tells us will also complete the building of it. And it'll be between joshua yeshua the high priest and king and this modern day zerubbabel who will rule together that is how the beginning of trumpets and the beginning of the building of the third temple will take place but the whole world has missed the first seven years but what the jews are looking for and what they understand is the events that happens at the end of six years of seals that is what they are looking for that is the stuff in their prophecies that they know Messiah has not fulfilled. And we know it too. Jesus never fulfilled all the prophecies yet. And that's why the Jews said, well, hey, if he's going to come and defeat all of our enemies and rebuild the third temple, why didn't he? Well, hold on a second. When he came, the second temple was still standing. Because he didn't come for them. They got blinded for our sakes so he can come and save the lost sheep. And when the blinders come off after the lost sheep have been saved of the great multitude rapture, they're going to recognize them. And that's why Luke in order was so powerful because in Luke chapter three, which is the same picture of the end of seals when he's coming and they recognize him, and John the Baptist had come and it was now put to death. We now see why they said, why he says in Luke chapter three from the last video, who have told you to flee from the wrath to come? Hello. And if we end it right here in Zechariah <clears throat> chapter 8, the beginning of trumpets, we even see, so again, oh, right here, even starting in chapter 8, verse 13, and it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not but let your hands be strong. You see, Judah's there too. Why? Because they will recognize him at the end of seals, having defeated his enemies in the Revelation 17, the, the first battle, the one Ephraim turns from. They will have seen that happen, which is what they were waiting for to happen. And then there will be a, a, a covenant made at the end of the seventh year of seals, and then the rebuilding will begin. And they were looking for one high priest and the one who will rebuild and the two will reign together. You see, that's the beginning of trumpets. That's the seven years the Jews have been looking for. Unfortunately, they miss the fact that they must be removed from the land for the next seven years so that it can rest before the temple can be rebuilt. And the church has missed that same first seven years years brothers and sisters 
I pray this blesses you. I was, I'm so grateful to, to be able to share these with you. It means a lot to me. I wouldn't change it for anything. Um, just being able to track this. Watch it again. Spend some time in it. If there's things that you're not sure of, go to the scriptures and, and discern them. Follow the storyline and just watch it in parts and pieces. That prophetic story is all there. We can see who these workers are. It's just a matter of the Lord revealing who they are when their time comes, and they will all know it when the time comes. With that, brothers and sisters, I love you. I love your families. I pray for you every night. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.